I got the push. Good evening, everyone. Please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. And that's going to be followed by the Black National Anthem. It's going to be sung by Megan Hackett, a student at Buzz Aldrin Middle School. She's a performer. She's an amazing musician and we do this in honor of African American History Month um, but every day is a celebration of African American history. Thank you for being here. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America 
and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Lift every voice and sing Till earth and heaven ring Ring with the harmonies of liberty Let the rejoicing rise High as the listening skies let it resound loud as the rolling sea. Sing a song full of the faith that the dark past has taught us. Sing a song full of the hope that the present has brought us. Facing the rising sun of our new day begun. Let us march on till victory is won. I'd like to thank each and every one of you for making a decision to join us here this evening to receive an update on the status of legalization of recreational, adult recreational marijuana use in the Garden State and to hear pros and cons of the aspects of Senate Bill uh, 2703 and talk about the legalization of adult recreational marijuana use in general. We meet at a critical point in what some have dubbed the weed discussion in the garden. It appears as though our governor, Phil Murphy, and the state legislative leaders have reached a deal in principle as to how to tax and regulate marijuana, which removes one of the greatest hurdles in the legalization. So what I've just suggested is that these are things that I've heard. I've heard them, I, I read things, it's like the scuttlebutt, but um, for anybody in this room that knows me, you know that I tend not to engage in speculation, conjecture, or rumor mongering. I'm a scientist, a physician by education, and I trained and I serve and I thrive by facilitating data-driven engagements and uh, taking data-driven actions. And so tonight I'm hoping that we can provide um, a lot of information that, while it may not be 100% data, but it's bordering on things that, that will um, allow all of us to learn something new. We'll take something home. So um, beginning in about November of 2018, when a House Senate committee of the New Jersey State Legislature for the first time approved a bill to legalize recreational adult marijuana use, people across the township, they started calling me and texting me and hitting me up on Facebook and they're like, so Baskerville, what does this mean? Will they create a special sin tax on dollars generated by the weed in the garden and can we use it for improving our schools? Will it create an alternative tax and finally get y'all in Montclair to lower our taxes? Will it increase the crime rate or will it provide a more level playing field in terms of the disproportionate percentage of minorities and low income folks that are going to prison for smoking a joint? Then I heard over and over, well, I don't know where I stand with this marijuana legalization thing, but the one thing I know is that I stand strong with decriminalization. And I heard that repeatedly. Somebody said, well, you're a doctor. What might this mean for the health of our residents? Somebody else said, hey, sis, you and I, you know, we go way back. We God-fearing sisters. And some of my friends uh, are Rastafarians. And so in particular, what will this do? They, they smoke weed in their religious observances. Will the bill 
be constitutional if it includes medicinal usage, if it includes recreation usage, and if it does not include religious usage. The questions kept coming. Mayor Jackson, I'm sure you know, I'm sure you were getting a lot of questions too, and I did the best that I could to answer them with the information I had and leaning heavily on, again, what I was reading. And so I started thinking and I said, well, if legalization is inevitable, and if you read uh, the, the information that has been printed uh, recently, it seems as though uh, there's a large number of people that have voting power that, that may be leaning towards uh, voting in favor of this. So if it's inevitable, then for me, I want to know about the possibility of new economic opportunities to establish and get in on front the front end of the potential of $50 billion enterprise for which we might prepare some of our underemployed and unemployed residents. I'm also concerned with a range of taxation issues such as how will the taxes be apportioned? Might a, proportion, a proportionate greater share of the dollars be used to, to fill the gap between tax dollars in high revenue generating areas and lower revenue de new generating areas and Abbott districts to invest in the public schools that are being left behind? And as a doctor, I am assuredly interested in the physical and mental impacts of regular recreational use of marijuana. Although recently the Surgeon Generals seem to think that there's no adverse effects, but others, other people that I respect in the health profession are given pause with that idea. Some of them even go so far as to say that smoking marijuana regularly might have an adverse on underlying mental illness. We have some people here tonight who will offer some opinions regarding that. So I'm delighted this evening um, to, to have a panel of individuals with us. And so how did I get here? Um, it was a, towards the end of November after I saw that, that um, I got some literature in the mail. And it was from uh, Senator Ron Rice. Thank you so much, Senator, for being here with us. Our Senator Ron Rice represents the 28th Legislative District for many years, since um, 1986, and he's doing an outstanding job. He also is the chair of the New Jersey Legislative Black Caucus, and I'm a member of that, and, and you serve us well in that capacity, Senator, so thank you. And here's what his correspondence says. It says, fellow colleagues, legislators, if you are preparing a a community meeting, a town hall meeting. I, I want to let you know that I am, um, will be more than happy to join you and lend voice to your discussions on uh, recreational marijuana, legalization, and what that might look like. And I was just so excited that somebody was reaching out to me for a change, asking for an opportunity to join a meeting. I immediately called the senator back and we spoke shortly and said, well, Renee, you know, I have something else that night, but I'm going to move it around because this is so important. And so um, our senator's here, and, and I'm grateful for that. This evening on our panel, we also have with us Montclair's mayor, my mayor, Mayor Robert Jackson, my comrade, one who shares my interest in getting, giving, getting wise counsel from persons who, who bring different lenses. Our Mayor John J Jackson is in his 10th consecutive year of leadership here. He had prior service here um, as elected official. But this is an interesting African American history moment. He is the only individual that ever served two consecutive terms as a mayor in the township of Montclair ever. And he's an African American mayor. So I want you guys to take notes and write this down because it's important that we share this history. There's a bunch of history up here, but it's important that we share that and we write our history because if we don't tell it, no one will, and that's very important. And that speaks to the outstanding job that he's doing here in Montclair. He took a, a, a community that was um, having some, some concerns, possibly in the fiscal area, to uh, giving us a triple A bond rating here in Montclair. It doesn't get any better than that.
and so when I reached out to to Mayor Jackson and I told him what we were doing he said you know absolutely Renee and I appreciate you for what you're doing and I wouldn't consider um, having this meeting without Mayor Jackson thank you Mayor Jackson this evening, um, we also have another champion in, in the New Jersey State Legislature with us here tonight, Senator Nia Gill. She is my friend, my sister, my mentor, uh, my, my, my Mountie buddy. She is, is Mountie born, Mountie born. And when she dies, she'll be Mountie born. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> And so, as a daughter of Montclair, many of the opinions that our Senator Gill has and her understanding principles, her lenses, her strategic maneuvers and grit come from growing up here in Montclair, while she also started and continues a robust law practice. Um, and so, I am extremely grateful, Senator Gill. A bit of information another African American history moment. Senator Gill's understanding about how to, to make the legislative branch work for her constituents comes in part from her service as legislative aide to the late Winona Lipman, who in 1971 became the first African American woman to be elected to New Jersey State Senate. So thank you so much, Senator. Okay, um, Assemblyman, I didn't see you come in, but thank you so very much uh, for, for coming here. We have with us tonight also our Assemblyman, Thomas P. Giblin. Um, he's the, uh, been in the Assembly seat in the 34th Legislative District since when? 2007? When did you come in? About then? 2006, I think he was sworn in in January, yeah, 2006, and um, he's been doing amazing things. I know he needs no introduction because Assemblyman Giblin is everywhere, and he supports everyone, and there's nothing that I can't say other than the fact that he uh, sets the bar so high in leadership. I try to keep up with him. I think I'm doing a pretty good job, and he's still got more win left than going to another event, and I'm telling him I got to go home. But he's amazing in his relentless service, and I'm just so honored, Assemblyman, that, that you would be here. Thank you so much. Well, hello, my sister. How are you? It's a lieutenant governor, and I'm just so excited. I'm going to have to jump right to it. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Our lieutenant governor just, just joined us, and uh, she, she is, is amazing. Um, she was sworn in to the seat of lieutenant governor on January 16, 2018. And before that, she provided in excess of 13 years in the, uh, the General Assembly of Outstanding service and um, she the governor appointed her to the um, commission of the Department of Community Affairs and I'm just so excited that that she would would see it not Aubrey to be with us here tonight and, and when I text her because um, she's been a mentor of mine for for so 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 long and this is not the first time that she's agreed to come to one of our community meetings that's that's what she does she she does people and, and she does it well and so um, I text her and I said hey sis how are you and I'm just reaching out and I said well you know I hope things are, are going well for you and I said this is what we're doing in Montclair next Tuesday I know that you've climbed the ladder you are now sitting in lieutenant governor's seat probably don't have time for this type of town hall community meeting but if you're in the area you know I'd just be so honored if you could stop by and uh, uh, to, 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 to my delight, by the next morning, there was a text and it said, I will be there. And so thank you so, so very much. <laughs> and the Lieutenant Governor is here tonight because of the importance of the issues that we're going to discuss, but also the importance of each and every one of us. And I'm so grateful that she adjusted her schedule to be here. And 
Lieutenant Governor, that's just a testament of your understanding uh, that in our great state there is no district or no township that's too small to, to warrant your attention and you've been consistent with that throughout the years. And so I thank you, I thank you, I thank you. And we also have this evening uh, freeholder president Brendan Gill, who's also a dear friend of mine. Um, he was also recently sworn in um, to the seat um, January 25th of 2019, sworn in as the um, 78th president of the New Jersey um, Association of Counties. And I am just so proud um, that he's here with us. I'm proud to call him my friend. He's amazing. He's been heading our Montclair Democratic Committee since, gosh, 2007, right? About that time, 2007, doing amazing things. And um, he's here tonight. He, he's um, a, a great dad to Gabrielle and, and Kristen Leah. He plays a little couple of sports. What do you play? <laughs> Some lacrosse. But he's um, a good all-around guy. He's very approachable, and he represents us as our Essex County Freeholder President. And thank you for being here with us. <laughs> Proud to call you a friend. Okay. Um, let's see. I'm going this way. Okay. And so we have also with us this evening, we have our um, Montclair prosecutor, Mr. Joseph Angelo, and um, he's a chief municipal prosecutor here in Montclair and in Belleville, I believe. Um, and he's been um, taking things to, to new heights and, and opening up um, for better understandings in this whole process. And um, I was speaking with him about what we were doing here, and he said, you know, I'm, I'm there. I see what goes on from his vantage as the um, municipal prosecutor all the time. And so, you know, sh I would be happy to come in, lend voice, listen, learn. And the whole thing is about us respectfully listening to one another and learning. And so I thank you so much for being with us this evening. And next to him is my lifetime friend, Dr. Cynthia Page. She is um, an amazing uh, family physician, family practice medicine in West Orange. And she's been providing incredible service, human, respectful service to, to people for about 30 years. And she started out at UMDNJ. Um, and I kept telling her, well, you know, I'd love for you to be my doctor, but, you know, I don't feel like going down there and fighting for parking. So when you open your office in West Orange, you know, give me a call. And so she gave me a call, and she's been providing wonderful service for myself and my family uh, for the past few years as well. In addition to um, having an outstanding knowledge of conventional medicine. To her credit, she also practices acupuncture. She's a strong believer in meditation, um, naturopathic things. She's open to hearing what makes you feel good. So when I tell her, yeah, I'm loading up on vitamin C and I have some D's and a couple of other vitamins, she doesn't say, Baskerville, you're wasting your money. She says, and, and how do you feel? And that's just the type of person that she is. Um, I believe that she is a, you're a triathlete, is that it? Yes, yeah, and she is a celebrated triathlete, um, dear friend, and I'm just so happy that you would come and bring a perspective. She travels around the state and beyond, and she discusses um, marijuana and some other things. So I think that you will find her to be a valuable resource here this evening, too. Thank you so much for being here, Doc. <laughs> and on this end, I have Mr. Frank Barnes III. Mr. Frank Barnes III is a 22-year-old Montclair resident. Montclair High School graduate, the class of 2014. He's a recent graduate from Stony Brook's University Program of Health Sciences, Sciences of the School of Health Technology and Management. He's newly minted trustee member of the Board of the Hearing Loss Association of America. 
He's also a mentor for the Bionic Ear Association, and he volunteers time with the African American Culture Committee for the Montclair Arts Association. I am extremely happy that just as recently as Saturday, when we ran into each other, we were down looking at skating in Glenfield School, Montclair Film Festival. Anybody see that? That was amazing, too. But we were there, and he came over, and he said, I saw what you're doing. And I said, wow, you know, I don't have a lot of, of age diversity. I know no one in, in the 20 age group and to me it's important when you're doing these things to try to have a pretty well-rounded panel of people and so at that time I said hey you want to join us and he didn't hesitate and I've known him um, for a while he, he is truly amazing you guys need to get to know him you'll have an opportunity to hear from him tonight but I'd like to thank you um, Mr. Frank Barnes the third for being with us <laughs> And also tonight we have Mr. S Stu Zakim, and he is coming as the PR um, expert for the Marijuana Business Association. So I don't know Stu personally. So after I uh, put out the flyer that I was doing this meeting, all kinds of people approached me and told me how I should do my meeting, who I should invite to my meeting, and why my meeting wasn't well balanced. And I tried to listen because it's a learning process for all of us. So I listened to people and when I called Stu back and he started talking and he was sharing some information. Well, you don't have anybody from the business in uh, marijuana. And I said, okay, you know, that's a good point. And, and I hadn't thought about that. I thought we had a, an amazing panel of, of leadership here and those type of things. And I thought about it for a while. I said, okay, Stu. I said, are you available to come and be that person? And so. Mr. Zakim said yes, he would come and um, be that person. He also he said he had some, some friends that he would bring. And we had a, an amazing conversation. And in the short time that we were getting to know each other over the telephone, I um, was convinced that, that we needed to have Stu. And so Mr. Zakim is here tonight also to, to add a different perspective to this conversation. So thank you so much for being here. Okay, so um, what we're going to do is, um, if it's okay with the Lieutenant Governor, I'd like to um, start with you. And um, we're going to, to hear from, from our panel. And um, after we give every one of our panelists an opportunity to share in a few moments what, whatever they'd like to share, um, then we're going to open it up for question and answers and, and see where we go. But I'm hoping we'll have a robust dialogue. I'm hoping that we'll all learn something. And at least when I see many of you around and ask you to give me one of the African-American history facts that I threw out tonight, you'll be able to give me at least one. So, um, Lieutenant Governor, thank you very much. Okay. Alongside of Assemblyman Giblin. And so I'm no stranger to Montclair and its neighborhoods and its people and, uh, you know, its, its perspective. So uh, I am pleased to be here. Uh, no, the fact that I'm no longer in the legislature, I'm not really engaged in uh, the robust debates that are being taken place uh, in both chambers, and certainly you're going to get that perspective from Assemblyman Giblin and from our senators. But, um, you know, for, for many, many years we have debated the issue of legalization of marijuana in our state. While I was in the legislature, we did move and we did enact legislation to create medical marijuana. And we'll hear from people like Dr. Page, who probably can give us insight in that regard. But one of the reasons that Governor Murphy um, has 
worked with the speaker and with Senate President Sweeney to promulgate and move forward legalization in New Jersey. Our administration looks at the social justice side of the issue. Many of us are, are extremely concerned about the number, uh, particularly the number of minority men and women who have had their lives deconstructed because they have convictions for possession of marijuana. I know as an assembly person, I dealt through the years with many constituents and their parents who had to be confronted with that. So we, be we believe that if we look around the country and if we look, you know, what has occurred in other states, the issue of legalization should be examined and should be embraced uh, just for the whole social justice aspect uh, alone. Uh, we will hear from many of the panelists this evening their various perspectives about legalization. Many people have asked our administration, why is it taking so long for us to make a decision about this issue? This is a very uh, tedious process. Uh, there are many aspects of it. Uh, there, there are concerns that have been expressed by law enforcement, by the medical profession, by uh, parents, and um, if we're going to reach a consensus about legalization in New Jersey, it's important that all voices be heard. But for Governor Murphy and our administration, we lean toward the issue of the social cost <coughs> for continuing to imprison people for convictions of possession of marijuana. Uh, once you have a felony conviction, um, you are no longer able to acquire certain licenses. Um, uh, you are barred from voting in some instances. And uh, we believe that like the states across the country who have moved towards legalization or Canada to the north, that it's time for us to embark down this road. S but I'm here this evening to listen to all the perspectives and all the points of view um, so that I can lend my voice to the dialogue uh, in our uh, State House and uh, give a perspective from the people of the Republic of Montclair. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, and so she gets two African American history moments, probably more than that, but I'm going to give you two of them. Um, in 2010, the now Lieutenant Governor um, became the first African American female uh, to become the Speaker of the General Assembly in New Jersey ever, and the second in the nation to become the Speaker of the General Assembly. So, yeah. Thank you, Thank you Councilor. And African American history, um, the second one that I'm going to give you, and again, I know I'm, I'm missing s some because you're just such an amazing person, is that um, it, when she, she's the um, first African American female uh, lieutenant governor when she um, was sworn in January 16, 2018, and I'm so excited that, that she's in that seat and that she's here with us. So. Thank you. Thank you. Write them down. <laughs> okay. So um, next we'll hear from our senator, Nia Gill. Thank and thank you again for being here. Thank you. Thank you. I do not oppose the legalization of recreational marijuana. I voted for and supported medical marijuana. And in fact, one of the first medical marijuana dispensaries in the state of New Jersey opened up three to four doors down from my Senate office, which was previously located on Bloomfield Avenue. Whether you are for or against legalization of marijuana, we must understand the details of what is and what is not in Senate Bill 2703 and Assembly Bill 4497, the New Jersey entitled the New Jersey Cannabis Regulatory and Expungement Aid Modernization Act. And as we all know, the devil is in the details. Yes. 
The following areas have been advanced by proponents of the legalization of recreational marijuana as a social justice aspects of the legislation. And those areas are expungement, impact zones and licensing pursuant to impact zones, and racial disparities in race. The areas of concern based on my review of the legislation are the expungement process, the small amount of marijuana allowed to be expunged, and the so-called impact zone and the licensing pursuant to the impact zones as well as racial disparity in arrest. When you make an analysis of the bill, you will or I have based on that analysis come to the determination that this bill does not effectuate social justice. And the analysis of that, and I look forward to the discussion tonight, will based on factual uh, information and the specific parts of the bill that claim to be social justice, but in fact will not result in social justice. And so as we are, uh, we like to say, we're not going to accept 40 acres in a mule. We're not going to accept with all deliberate speed. We are going to look at the bill that the governor, the Senate president, and the speaker have agreed upon and are going to advance for our votes. Now, I will cast a vote, but it will be a vote based on what is or isn't in the bill, what was promised, what has been delivered, and what has been neglected. So I thank you for inviting me here, and I look forward to our discussion tonight on those issues. Thank you very much, Senator. Okay. <laughs> Senator Ron Rice. Thank you very much, and thanks for inviting me and having me, and good evening to everyone. Um, I'm very adamant about opposing the legalization of recreational marijuana, and I tell everybody publicly, it offends me when people don't do enough research. Oh, your mic, um, um, Senator. When people don't do enough research on their own. No, you know, this whole debate is been about money, who will make money. It's been about um, wealthy folk coming in. It's been about we have to get this done right away. And you just sat here and heard that there are problems um, that are being looked at. It's being sold under the auspices of social justice. And to be quite frank about it, black people are being used in the process as it was during the Jim Crow laws. And the reason I said that is because we are told that in Colorado and elsewhere, and I've been looking at this stuff for a number of years, that the reason that we are doing legalization of recreational marijuana, which, by the way, is different than medical, mm -hmm. and they keep trying to mix the two to confuse you mm -hmm. and others. Mm -hmm. And so the recreational piece is what I'm opposed to. They said that it's social justice, and they don't, do not believe that black folk, and that's just the way they put it, that they add brown once in a while, should be in prison three times greater than white people who get arrested for the same amount of marijuana. We in the African American community, we've been saying that for a number of years mm -hmm. about all the drugs. The reality is no one listened. They never listen until it becomes about money. And so as a result of that, Colorado, Portland, Washington DC, Seattle, et cetera, moved to legalization, uh, some different than others. This type of information requires what is known as a longitudinal study that has not been done. And a longitudinal study is when you measure your cores out, and usually a good study is about 20 years. But what we do know since 2012, 
we know that there are a number of things that's happening that's not being told to the public. That, that's my beef with the legislature, the governor, the Senate president, and all those other folks, including some of my colleagues in, in the Legislative Black Caucus, is that we're not going out to tell you what we know. And we're not telling you what we foresee. Let me tell you what we know. And by the way, before I do that, when you talk about legalization of recreational marijuana, and the governor and, 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 and the Senate president, the leadership says that it's not about money, it is about money. And if that was the case, then when you talk about um, social justice, we can get that by decriminalization. Right. This means nobody make money, but we still get set free as a people. And so in Colorado, this experiment took them from knowing nothing to a lot of confusion to the point where the governor says that he saw he kind of did this, and for us to take a look at what they're doing, the problems they're having. And we're not doing that. I think what you heard up here, you can't rush this by the end of the month. Just listen to those people who just spoke recently. Well, out there we found out that the number of newborn babies, and this is not guesswork, you don't guess this stuff. The number of newborn babies has increased tremendously with TAC on the brains. Those are our babies, and Colorado is not New Jersey. And then we have recognized that the number of women who are pregnant and breastfeeding, THC on the breast. We recognize while we in New Jersey are trying to reduce emergency room visits, that the number of visits in emergency rooms out there by young people for marijuana illnesses has gone up tremendously. We know that when you do marijuana, the recreation, when you legalize recreational marijuana, the number of people, people sitting out here and others who never thought about trying any type of substance, never thought about it, we know that they tried and the usage go up tremendously. We know that college students go up tremendously in terms of use, those who have never thought about using it, and some of them are dropping out of school and they are bench drinking with the marijuana. We know that. New Jersey is a college state and the college towns are all around us. We know that the drug cartels are saying from Mexico, thank you very much. Um, for legalizing recreational marijuana because we no longer have to send it on the black market. That's what you're concerned about because you gave us the ability to send our people from Mexico to Colorado, Nevada, elsewhere and buy the licenses legally. So we can legally grow marijuana now as Mexican cartels and send it to the black market. That's a documented fact. We know that. We, we know that the number of accidents has gone up with THC being measured. They may have alcohol with the too, but THC is there. We know that. You can't get insurance in New Jersey. We know that, let's talk about, and a couple of things about Colorado. Those growth farms that'll be here in New Jersey, maybe Warren County, someplace like that, Hunter County, you have legal growers out there and you have cartels. Russian cartels have moved in. The Cuban cartels have moved in now. The, the college students going to pick the pulp. The women are being uh, sexually molested and abused, and now human trafficking is starting to take place. We know that in New Jersey, but we're not telling you about that. That's why I get offended, because it impacts your lives, my life, and all of our kids come behind us. Let's talk about what we know about New Jersey. We know in New Jersey that right now, this is not new, right now you take the urban cities in particular, you got two and three bodegas on every corner. You have liquor stores on every corner. You got places that sell, we sell chicken. When you walk in, there's a bulletproof glass and you have to hand your money through it. Chinese food, the same thing. We know that. We have vacant lots. New Jersey leads the country in foreclosures. Counties like Essex lead the state in foreclosures. Cities like Newark and urban cities lead cities in foreclosures. We're seeing a renaissance in some of these cities and all of a sudden we have shootings and violence on a regular basis and all of a sudden we're saying to compound the problems. So all those people who are looking to come and be a part of a renaissance decide that we're not going to go there because you just did something stupid um, that's going to measure out long term to be negative impact in those communities. And so we know in New Jersey that people right now are going into bodegas with food stamps and they are cashing the food stamps in. And they're being ripped off, and they'll take that little money, and they're going to the street corners, including some of your Montclair kids who are coming down there, and Montclair families, okay, to our corners, if they get past Grove Street. So, so we know what's going on, and they cash them. 
Well, if in fact the number of people, when you legalize recreational marijuana, if the numbers increase substantially, I'm telling you, I don't have to guess this, that within this new group of users who never used before or thought about using, there are gonna be some food stamp people. And some of those food stamp people, when they start liking these gummy cupcakes and all this other stuff, they're gonna start to take the food stamps to the same bodegas to cash them in. And I'm gonna tell you what's gonna happen. When my kid come to school and your kid come to school, and my kid try to take your kid food, the teacher, Mr. Gill, is going to ask him, are you hungry? Yes, I am. Did you eat today? No, because some of our kids don't eat. Or I had a little bit. The teacher's not going to call the parent. They're going to snatch your kid out the house, unintended consequences. We know that. Let's just say, for example, what we know. I don't have to guess this. My office is on the corner of Sanford and South Orange Avenue. I'm three blocks from South Orange, New Jersey, where Seton Hall University is. And you know South Orange, New Jersey is situated like Montclair, New Jersey, economically. I rep that that town has rich people, upper middle class, middle class, and working people and families and students. It's a predominantly white community. So two things I want to point out that's foreseeable based on what we know. One thing, if Newark decides to legalize recreation, and by the way, they need to stop calling these stores dispensary. The dispensary is where you should go and do the metal piece, but they are talking about putting retail edible stores in these communities, where you go and you buy a cupcake or some lipstick so your little kid can go home and play mommy around the house. And you can buy candy and gummies that kids are getting already, and we haven't even legalized the edibles yet. But in Newark, if we decide that we want to do this, in South Orange, three blocks from my office, East Orange, which is on the same avenue as my office, and Irvington around the corner from me, and Maplewood over there, decide they don't want it, then I know what's going to happen. These inquisitive folk who never used before, and some who, does, who do use, they're going to come across the borders, three blocks to my office, to buy and try this, this new product, this innovation, the cupcakes, etc. I'm telling you, I'm not guessing this. I live there every day. Somebody's going to be violently assaulted or killed. That's what's going to happen. And they're going to say it's Newark when it's not Newark. It's the person trying to get that product, whether it's cupcake, gummy, or money. Now, let's assume that Newark said they don't want the store. And South Orange community said they do. I'm going to tell you what I know is going to happen. What's going to happen is Newark, where I am, is a predominant black and brown community. And I've got knuckleheads on the corners. That's why you read the paper three blocks from my office. I get a shooting every three or four months, okay, if I don't get a killing, a homicide. But the knuckleheads who don't do cupcakes now, but they sell drugs, they're going to go up there and, and see what it's like. It's inquisitive. But the people who never use any type of substance that want to try it, they're going to start to go to South Orange because Newark won't have a store, which means there's going to be an influx of traffic into South Orange that does not traditionally go to South Orange unless they go on the weekend and buy dinner or something like that. And the police department, mayor, is going to have to legally stop somebody for some reason sooner or later, and the first thing the newspaper is going to say is racial profiling. And Senator Gill and I, an assemblywoman at the time, Lieutenant Governor Sheila Oliver, we have hearings up and down the state. We address the racial profile. I don't need to see that coming back again. Okay. We address with our money. So and the final thing is the state is duping everybody on expungement because the state told us nobody want to hear this and the governor's not talking about it. We cannot expunge these records immediately. A racial profile uh, a, a study impact statement is necessary, number one. Number two, the disparity study be done because you can't do set aside. And so there's a lot of information. I can give you much more, but I want to, I've been too long. But you need to make sure that folk coming before you give you this kind of information and all the new information like this has come out on a daily basis. We should not rush this thing. There should be no bill between now and the end of the year or next year or never. Thank you very much, okay. Senator. So um, for those of you that, that weren't here at the beginning of the meeting when I said that if you'd like to make comments, I'd, we'd love to hear from you. There's a sign-in um, sheet of paper here now, and I'm, I'm going to start passing it around. And I really prefer, you know, that we try our best.
to keep our comments for the time that you will be allowed to come up um, to the front because I'm going to try to allow right now only four people on the sign up so please sign up and come up and share what what you have to say because we, we might all be able to learn something from you thank you very much um, senator and so um, at this time I would like to um, ask our um, assemblymen Tom Giblin, if you would um, share something, and thank you so much for being with us, Assemblyman. Thank you, uh, <laughs> Councillor uh, Baskerville, for bringing us uh, all together uh, here in Montclair. Uh, we have a great cross section of the community here, and in, in a lot of ways, it's like a cross section of uh, Americana looking out uh, in the audience. And I think that's uh, a good mixture, especially when we're making a important decision uh, with the issue of recreational marijuana. Um, going back uh, when a decision uh, was uh, made about the use of medicinal marijuana, I was in support of that uh, effort uh, and you know we've seen it in place for uh, a number of years and certainly I think that uh, most medical people see positive things that have emanated from the uh, ability of people who have serious illnesses uh, to get uh, the medical marijuana. In fact, uh, the uh, recreational, no, the uh, medicinal marijuana center here in Montclair, uh, I was on the original board of directors of the uh, facility when we uh, put it all together and had to go through the necessary steps of permission on the state level and also here on the local level to site uh, a uh, center and I know there was some trepidation that could be some negative uh, repercussions but that's not necessarily been the case uh, at all. Uh, I've heard of no uh, negative uh, matters that have emanated from that summer. Uh, there's a lot of factors to weigh into this uh, decision and upcoming vote. You know, you have to look at the people who are involved, uh, who uh, understand medicine and about the repercussions that uh, medicinal recreational marijuana could have on our citizens. Uh, we have to think of our uh, law enforcement personnel. Uh, you know, we've seen a situation yesterday, I think it was up in Wayne, where we had a, a young person that caused the death of three individuals at a, um, you know, gas station. You know, they said it was in, under the influence of drugs. Uh, I'm not sure it was necessarily uh, marijuana, but it is, it is a factor. Uh, one of the concerns I have, you know, thinking about this issue for, in terms of law enforcement, now, when you stop uh, an individual for uh, what you perceive to be, you know, driving under the uh, influence and the alcohols in question, there's ways that you can uh, kind of ascertain that uh, relatively quickly, you know, through uh, breathalyzers or observe, observing them walking or even uh, taking them to the hospital. With the issue of impairment under marijuana, I, I don't see how you can not wind up taking these individuals to a hospital or a medical facility to do a blood test uh, to get a really inaccurate uh, portrayal of, or, you know, are they under the influence. Uh, another uh, area that I want to really see uh, nailed down, you know, they talk a lot about expungement. Uh, I'm involved in the labor movement uh, all my life. Uh, I've sponsored uh, expungement programs, and I've had people from the courts, I've had people from the prosecutor's office. Uh, this is not a walk in the park, you know, trying to get records expunged. Uh, it's a very uh, laborious process, uh, a lot of paperwork. Uh, there's some uh, fees involved, but it doesn't happen overnight. And, you know, it's not going to be some kind of magic wand that... Uh, uh, you're going to see, you know, uh, we have legislation and now your slate is uh, wiped clean. So th that's a matter that I want to see uh, better um, understood and, and, and reined in. 
Uh, on the flip side of that, uh, being involved, as I said, in the labor movement, uh, I'm the chief executive officer of a union that has over 6,000 members. Uh, I deal with many employers up and down the state of New Jersey. Uh, I'll be frank with you, a lot of employers, in fact, most of employers, I, I dare say that, uh, talk a great game about giving second chances. Mm -hmm. The reality is they don't give second chances. Mm -hmm. And if they find out you have a conviction uh, for a felony, you know, uh, they might take you in and interview you and give you a pat on the head and say, well, I'll be back in touch with you. But uh, a lot of people, once they go down that wrong road of being a uh, felon or have any type of crime conviction, uh, they don't get the second chances they uh, hope for, uh, even if they've tried to go the right roads. So this is something I think is also important to build people's hopes up that they're going to get their uh, conviction erased and they're going to get a job and life is going to be rosy. Uh, you have to get people who provide the jobs, you get they have to get them to buy uh, into it. So uh, there's areas that we have to really uh, evaluate. You know, we have to look at this thing with the um, our prisons. What is that going to mean, you know, in terms of released prisoners, if that be the uh, case? Uh, we have to look at our judges, how they're going to handle that. Will they have discretion uh, in terms of uh, people who come before them as far as, you know, handing out uh, sentences? Uh, you know, I, I think it's something, you know, the revenue is an important factor. There's no two ways about that. You know, for the state, uh, we'll generate a fair amount of uh, income that perhaps can be used in a positive direction as far as the state is concerned. Uh, one important element, if these uh, dispensaries are cited, uh, it's uh, kind of incumbent, too, that uh, people who live in the neighborhood uh, people who reflect the face of New Jersey be given an opportunity to run these dispensaries. Uh, when we cited the um, uh, medicinal dispensaries, I was given a 48-page uh, questionnaire uh, that wanted to know basically what color socks I wore in eighth grade uh, from the uh, Department of Health. I'm not exaggerating. Uh, and if you have that type of same uh, deterrent uh, and you know that, that you really want to expose yourself to you're not going to find a lot of people who will want to partake of that they just won't disclose that type of uh, information not that I really had anything drastically to hide but it just uh, you know it really kind of infringes on, on uh, you know privacy and you know some of the things uh, that you, you want to keep to yourself but uh, with this whole uh, area, you know, there's still a lot of work to be uh, dealt with uh, as far as, you know, uh, passing this legislation. I know, you know, a lot of uh, people are very anxious about seeing this uh, done uh, before the end of June, before, you know, the summer recess, but I think we're going to need some more time to really properly uh, vet this whole thing out, talk to the people in law enforcement, talk to the judges talk to the medical folks, uh, talk to the people in the Department of Health, you know, just get a whole uh, uh, gamut of people that will be impacted, talking to the parents who will be uh, impacted as far as this is concerned. So I'm from the school of, you know, uh, learning more, and I have my ears open. I want to listen carefully to what uh, individuals have to say because, as I said, the people assembled here are cross-section of uh, New Jersey, the cross section of Americana, and your concerns are my concerns, and your things that you want to see incorporated in the bill. Uh, certainly, I'll do my part with my colleagues to make sure that uh, the best uh, comes out of that legislation. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay, let's go next to our um, freeholder president, our president of NJAC, and, and hear from you. Thank you, Councilor Baskerville, and thank you again for pulling us uh, all together um, tonight, and thank you for inviting me to be uh, on this panel. 
Uh, you mentioned a few firsts uh, and some history, uh, some tidbits, and just wanted to say uh, that uh, I was honored uh, to be a part of the effort uh, to elect uh, the first African American woman as Lieutenant Governor of the State of New Jersey. So yes. honored, honored to be a part of that. Um, uh, honored to have worked on uh, many of the campaigns of the people that I serve on this panel uh, with, uh, and also um, proud to be uh, born and raised. Uh, I, I don't think of it as the People's Republic. I know Governor Murphy calls it the People's <laughs> um, Republic of Montclair, but I think um, that uh, this room tonight uh, is uh, what Montclair is all about, which is just a cross-section of our community, uh, our very diverse community, and we're very proud of and I think we should be so and I want to thank you Dr. Baskerville for continuing to give us the opportunity to talk about um, these critical issues I, I'll be very brief um, both from a uh, and I speak tonight um, you know as, as an elected official as a citizen of this community uh, so although I did run the campaign I don't want to want in any way suggest that I'm speaking for the for the for the administration in, in any way um, I almost always agree um, with uh, with Senator Rice and you can see by that impassioned uh, presentation why you want to be on the same side of Senator Rice <laughs> on on an issue uh, but in this on this particular one I have to um, you know res respectfully uh, disagree um, this is um, this is a um, I, I think we as elected officials at every uh, level uh, need to listen uh, to the will of our constituents and I can tell you both in my conversations with many different people and groups across this state and everything that I've read is recently included in, and I don't say to suggest that we should govern by poll but all of the public polling that I've seen as recently as this week there was a statewide poll put out by Monmouth University uh, that says over 65 percent of the residents of this state want to see legalization of adult recreational uh, <coughs> marijuana and there's a variety of reasons that they want uh, to see that uh, whether they come from the criminal justice perspective whether they come from the economic perspective uh, whether they come from the medical perspective but I think there's a consensus uh, out there across this state and in our communities uh, that this is going to happen um, we're seeing it happen uh, in other states already uh, and what we want to do here uh, in New Jersey and I do agree with Senator Rice on this on this part and, and also with Senator Gill uh, Assemblyman Gillen uh, and our lieutenant governor is we want to make sure that we take the time to get it right and to right. get it correct Absolutely. and that means making sure that we do not rush uh, whatever legislation because my understanding right now is what I've read is that we don't have a uh, we don't have legislation yet to to look at we have a, we have the legislation that's done but we also have an agreement right so and and there's there might be further legislation based on this announced agreement that's put before the legislature put before us I guess my point is that we have some time you know we have some time to get to get this done and to get it done right and getting it done right in my opinion means making sure that we have the right regulatory process uh, in place uh, you know to to deal with this issue that we have some agreement on uh, what the long-term implications are for our local communities I think one of the big issues as a county office holder and I don't want to speak uh, for the mayor but at least in my kind of travels across this state is how we deal with the zoning issues uh, how we deal with the local the, the law enforcement issues the people who are going to be on the front lines of what the state eventually accomplishes to me that is a critical component it needs uh, a lot of debate and a lot of review uh, but ultimately um, I think we should move in that direction um, there's only one other state uh, in the country that has done adult recreational marijuana through uh, legislation through the legislative process that's Vermont I believe mm. uh, and the other states it's been done uh, through referendum um, okay. that's something that probably maybe needs to also be um, discussed mm -hmm. potentially whether whether that's the way we should mm -hmm. get there um, ultimately though I think putting this in the hands of the people that we elect to represent us mm -hmm. uh, is the best thing uh, to do and I ultimately hope that we do get there because um, it's going to happen the people are asking for it to happen they want it to happen and it's our job as legislators to get there in a safe and responsible manner
Thank you very much. So President Gill, I wasn't trying to um, shortchange you in the introduction and, and not mention okay. that. Um, we on the street, we call you the man with the golden hands because everybody's hands he has uh, in on a campaign is a winner. Um, you also headed the campaign for our governor, Phil Murphy, Cory Booker, Senator Lautenberg, Bill Pascrell, and uh, Joey D, just to name a few people. So I'm sorry if I did not um, let it be known how much we appreciate you and, and value you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank okay, you. Okay. So um, at this point in time, um, how about we hear from um, our prosecutor, maybe? Right. Yeah? Right. Okay. So Thank we'll you. complete that in, in the municipal level. I hope no one thinks that you're less valued. I'm just trying to do this in a flowing way. The mayor, as humble as he is, has already said that he would like to go last. So. Thank you, Dr. Yes. Baskerville. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for having me. So uh, when Dr. Baskerville approached me about this, uh, we talked about the law, and I want to make sure everyone understands the law in New Jersey. Uh, that is that as the municipal prosecutor, I deal with disorderly persons offenses. So a disorderly persons offense, as it deals with marijuana, is a case where uh, a person is arrested for having under 50 grams of marijuana. That comes in my jurisdiction, okay? The other place that I see marijuana is driving under the influence, uh, where the law is a little different than alcohol in that there are two tiers for driving under the influence of alcohol. One is if you're at a certain reading, you lose your license for a minimum and a maximum of three months. There's no discretion with the judges. If you are over a certain limit, which in New Jersey is .10, the minimum mandatory license revocation is seven months. The maximum is one year. On your second offense, it's a two-year loss of license. And on a third offense in New Jersey, it's a 10-year loss of license and a mandatory six months in jail. Now, if it's for under the influence of marijuana, there's no three months or seven months if it's marijuana or any other type of drug. Uh, the minimum mandatory is seven months. So on DWIs is the first way that I'll see them. And the second is with a, a under 50 grams uh, possession charge. And those are what we call disorderly persons offenses. So I wanted to make sure every, everyone was in the right context of what it is that I do as an initial mm -hmm. prosecutor. I am the, secre uh, the treasurer now of the State Municipal Prosecutors Association. I see some of my colleagues here and I thank them for coming. Mm -hmm. And this is really a treat for me to have all of you here, I must say, because we talk about it. We have meetings with statewide prosecutors, but to be here and be part of the process for me, I really appreciate everyone taking the time to do this. Uh, if anyone has any questions, I'm happy to answer them. But that's how I see marijuana cases. I'm not going to give my opinion. Um, my uh, supervisors at the Essex County Prosecutor's Office made sure I was not going to give my opinion. <laughs> so I'm not going to do that. Uh, but again, I just, uh, I'm, it's great to have everyone part of this process and see how this works. And I get to see how the law comes into effect before I uh, have to prosecute it. So that's it for me, unless anyone has any questions. Thank you. I'm just going to um, pause for a moment because I'd like to uh, recognize some of my colleagues as well. I see at the door we have our Deputy Mayor um, and our Third Ward Councilman, Mr. Sean Spiller. Thank you for being with us. I saw earlier our Councilman Bob Russo, who has been um, in, in the political arena here in Montclair for well over 15 years, I believe. I don't know if he's still here, but thank you. Oh, there you are, Bob. Thank you for being here. Are any of the other council members here? Um, I know Councilwoman Schlager was trying to get here. I'd also like to acknowledge our manager in the back, Mr. Tim, Staff Tim Stafford, our deputy manager in the back, um, Mr. Brian Scantleberry, um, some of Montclair's finest over here. We thank you for being here. Are any of the bravest in the room? Okay. Um, if I'm forgetting somebody, wave your hand and I'll try to try to see you. Um, and so that will um, bring us to Dr. Cynthia Page. And again, thank you for being here. Again, I'm, I'm hoping she's going to share a perspective um, with us that you, you're not often blessed to hear uh, because this is something that she does up and down the state of New Jersey. And um, she has a, a great understanding. So thank you very much, Doc. Thank you. You know, I never thought that uh, discussing the science of cannabis would be the easiest part of being on a panel. But in listening to our politicians, it, it seems that this may be the most straightforward aspect of, of the evening. 
There is a long history of psychoactive substances being regarded as dangerous and subsequently being banned, forbidden, and otherwise known as illegal. Initial bans and prohibitions were on alcohol, opium, cocaine, and cannabis. Subsequent controls were placed on man-made psychoactive substances such as LSD, barbiturates, amphetamines, benzodiazepines, and ecstasy. In the United Kingdom, controlled drugs are classified as Class A, B, or C. Class A includes heroin, cocaine, ecstasy, and LSD. Class B, less harmful, includes amphetamine and amphetamines and barbiturates. And up until a few years ago, cannabis was in Class B. Currently in the United Kingdom, cannabis is considered Class C, is in the class with Valium and anabolic steroids. In the United States, the DEA still includes marijuana as a Schedule I drug, drugs with no currently accepted medical use and a high potential for abuse. Also in that class are heroin, LSD, mescaline, and ecstasy. The drug classifications purportedly address the dangers posed by these substances. These dangers include dependence, as evidenced by psychological and physiological withdrawal symptoms when the drug is stopped. For example, with alcohol, high alcohol users who stop are at risk for seizures, tremors, and death. Secondly, we look at the abuse liability, or the, in other words, the abuse potential based on the pleasure derived from the substance. Next, in classifying drugs, we look at the seriousness of the public health and social problems, including personal and community problems. On a personal level, there's the risk of overdose, the risk for acute and chronic physical and mental illness, as well as death from chronic illnesses. On a community level, there's unintended harms, such as the risk of motor vehicle collisions with the use of the substance, mm. as well as the causal role in violence, such as homicide and date rape. We look at the effects on family relationships, as well as the risk of disease transmission, for example, with IV drug abuse. Next, we look at the medicinal benefits of the drugs. Scientifically, we understand that marijuana does not pose the same dependence or withdrawal effects as alcohol, benzodiazepines, or sleeping pills. Marijuana should be avoided in those with certain psychiatric disorders, especially schizophrenia. Mm. Marijuana negatively impacts memory for up to 24 hours. There is some evidence from the National Institute of Drug Abuse that it may also affect the IQ of young adults who use it in excess up to the point of about four IQ levels, four points on IQ scoring. Marijuana does not have the lethal overdose potential of alcohol, benzodiazepines, or opiates. Marijuana has fewer resultant chronic illnesses such as cancer, COPD, and cardiovascular disease when compared to tobacco, alcohol, and even sugar. Marijuana should be restricted to the use of adults, to use in adults, the same as alcohol, tobacco, and firearms. Marijuana should be used with caution, restraint, and moderation to prevent personal and community harms. There's numerous um, research articles on the medicinal effects of marijuana, which has made it easy or at least seamless for our politicians to agree to approve the use of medical marijuana. Thus, the question for this evening is, as science interfaces with politics and law, should the question be, how available should marijuana be and under what circumstance? Or should the question be, how do we determine the criminal punishment for possessing or using marijuana? Phrased another way, is this an issue for the judicial system or is this an issue for the judicious use of the cannabis plant and its ex right. Thank you so much. Yeah. Woo. Well said, good job. Well said, good doctor. Okay, at this time, I'm I'm going to um, go over to um, Mr. Mr. Stu Zakim, 
and, and allow you an opportunity, although I should put him in the timeout chair because he was uh, <laughs> shouting out when other people were speaking. But we do not help hear myself. From you. And then we're going to hear from Mr. Barnes, and then after that, we're going to get everybody up and, and hear from you. So thank you so very much. Thank you for having me. My name is Stu Zakum. Sorry to correct Zakum. you. Con Councilwoman, thank you for putting this together and for listening to me when I reached out to you because this is my goal in this business is about education I'm a public relations person about communications and when you educate people they can make informed decisions about topics such as we're here tonight to talk about when you hear some of the propaganda that's been pro put out on the table tonight as you mentioned I was making comments and I can't help myself because when I see the bad information the misinformation that's put out there that helps color people's opinions it, it actually makes me nuts. And I have colleagues here tonight from the professional organization of the NJCIA. Now, don't take the CIA component negatively. <laughs> it's the New Jersey Cannabis uh, Industry Association. And their goal, as in mine, we were very much in sync, is educating people to help eradicate the stigma of cannabis. Now, we've heard it called marijuana. We've heard it called cannabis. Thank God no one has said weed, pot, dope, because those are terms we really don't want to talk about. We were talking about this in a professional way. And it's a medicine that cures people's lives. Um, when we talk about some of the issues that have been brought up tonight, and I hope we can have an engaged conversation later with everyone here. And first of all, I really applaud the diversity of the audience here tonight. Right? Yeah. I mean, really. Yeah. When I, I, I go to events, as do some of my colleagues, yeah. three, four, and five nights a week. And it's never a mixed crowd like this. Usually it's been a white Jewish guys like me who are here. But to see this diversity is really uh, makes me enthusiastic about people's openness to talking about this topic. So I'm with the Marijuana Business Association, MJBA. I'm the head of communications. We started six years ago when Washington State, f before it went public, um, we knew that there was a lack of knowledge in the, uh, t for people out there to make informed decisions. And in the business community, people say, yeah, I want to be in a weed business, but I don't know what to do. Mm -hmm. So our job was to help connect them and educate them with people. And that's kind of what's going on uh, here on this level and in, in the state as well. They're working with our legislators to make sure they're making educated decisions. I, I can't, once again, applaud these guys more because they're in the trenches making sure that all the people who are weighing in on this bill know the information that they need to have. And they represent a lot of the people here tonight. So thank you for your efforts you and your group. Uh, without you, we would not be here. Um, and we're really here to talk about the perception. Now, people always say, well, what about the kids? We're talking about adult use cannabis, 21 plus, very much like alcohol. So why don't people raise the same issues about alcohol that they're raising with cannabis? And then uh, when you also talk about the kids, how many kids are going through your medicine chest and taking your opiates? Now, opiate addiction, we know, is a serious issue. I, in fact, lost a child two and a half years ago to opiate addiction. So my sensitivity to this is very, very on top of it. Cannabis cures opiate addiction, or helps it, rather. It changes the course. It works with many diseases that people are using dangerous drugs to, to medicate with. And when you see them become walking addicts, and we are now a nation of walking addicts, all because of the pharma industry and how they've kind of enforce their, their opinion on doctors to prescribe these things to us that are not healthy. Now, we know the numbers about how many people die of addiction every day. Nobody has ever died of an addiction, of an overdose rather, of cannabis. That's a, hard, that's a factual statement. Nobody has ever died of an overdose of cannabis. So then we look at this playing field here and the way that people are saying how we're going to endanger people's lives, it's about responsible use, as with any other substance. We are not the evil weed. When, do people come out and criticize the uh, drunk driving? How people dr drink underage, drive with cars? Now, when you talk about how you, DUIs, as the prosecutor mentioned, now, I have consumed cannabis for about 48 years on a regular basis. There's no way, if you did a blood test on me today, my blood will show cannabis use. Now, does that affect my focus, my ability? Am I, do I seem impaired here tonight? Absolutely not. I am a purely functional <laughs> human being who uses this product to enhance my life. I am the antithesis of the stoner, right? 
I'm not talking like, wow, well, man, I'm so high. I'm saying I'm speaking to you as an adult who has used this product to enhance my life. And as, as a result, I'm an advocate for this does to me, and I think it can do for a lot of other people. Here's my three minutes. Thank you. Thank you very Thank you. much. I appreciate it. Yes, yes, unless you want to take out. No, no. Okay. I'm, I'm very sorry for your loss, Stu. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, at this point in time, I'd like to um, ask Mr. Barnes III if you would be so kind as to um, share with us. And thank you so very much for taking time out of your schedule and for all that you're doing. All right. Well, good evening, everyone. Good evening. Can you all hear me okay? Yeah. Okay, so thank you to Dr. Bashville, Councilwoman Bashville, and the panel for engaging this. Everyone brings up a perspective that, to, to me, I want to make sure it's not opinion-based and more factual. To me, it indicates that you guys care enough to us. It's, it's on. It's on, okay. So that you guys care enough to take the time to examine this. And what I've realized as someone who's not s taken the time to read bills or watch recordings, that it is important for someone who maybe can't make it to Trenton to take the time out to read it. From something as little as recommending a movie or jumping onto the bandwagon to support a sports team, when you have your authority leaders, whether that be from entertainment, whether that be from your doctors, whether it be from your lawmakers, it's easy to say, yes, I'm behind an issue without knowing all the information. So as Senator Rice pointed out, the information is necessary to be shared. And as, as uh, Nia Gill has had mentioned that, knowing the contents of a bill is the utmost important because that is what's going to be recognized, not just your generational thought, not just your young adults per opinions of yeah this is what I want to do with my time it's about what's going to be enacted and what are the implications of it from a behavioral shift and as as was pointed out what do college students do if there is an increase in use what will be the behaviors outside of campus to match that and the groups I identify with if I have some if I'm someone with a hearing loss and I'm a young black man when I take in that into account and when I read a bill, when I have these discussions, it's a matter of importance to know how does it affect someone like me beyond, beyond what I would anticipate I will go through. Because if I'm a Montclair resident, what, will, what I might encounter with the Montclair police is different than what you might encounter in East Orange or Newark. And if it is a now, foreseeable, recognized, and, le and legalized behavior. When someone is in the public, drunk, it's not going to be the same as someone who is of fair skin to someone who looks like myself, even if it's a legal behavior. So I understand the concerns that my, the, both parents and other um, veterans of the community have expressed because they're coming from a time even when legal behaviors were scrutinized on a daily basis. As you said, going to see United States, something as little as that public activity was made difficult because of the external laws, but not so much laws, but the etiquettes that were dismissed because people said, we would rather, we can get treated one way and your group can, can be treated a different way, even when it's completely accessible. So as someone who's part of associations that are advocating outreach, access, and also social support, behavioral support, and ethical support, from something as, as simple as a mentorship program to those with the hearing loss, as something as simple as a mentorship program to someone with the hearing loss, I find it essential to come be here as someone who is now over 21 to say, okay, now that these generation behind me and the one that I am in currently 
has to make a decision. Once everyone here has voted on something, we have to decide what does that mean. Just because something is legal doesn't mean we act in that, um, act on it in the way that it was written out. So I am very, very excited that the policymakers in front of us are taking the time to examine it and also call it out in both a positive as well as a constructive criticism. Because otherwise, you will jump either behind an issue in, in support of it or against it from your own perspective without actually knowing who is it for. If I'm someone who is not a user and will never be a user, my opinions on it, even from a factual standpoint, are limited to here and now or what was. And we cannot reasonably predict what a 18 year old who will then turn 21 and be able uh, legally to do in this activity, either socially, religiously, or organizationally, from the professional standpoint, without at least opening the door to, to try that forward. There's always ways you can come back and say we'll just that didn't work we can we can go back to the way it was we can outlaw something again you can put new restrictions but to keep it the way it has always been has proven over time in many instances outside of legalization of cannabis that it cannot just stay that way out of not so much fear but uncertainty of change. So we're talking about big changes, and I appreciate that each of you bring forth your expertise and tries to separate your own implicit biases and own experiences, both positive and negative, and try to say it's not so much about what's going to happen in two years, three years. It's really about what is it gonna be a generation from now and I would hope that I can be able to talk to someone if I'm a parent 30, 40, 50 years old and, and actually say it from a destigmatized standpoint and not just say, I'm afraid of this because I don't know it. I want people in the room to be as familiar as they can with it so that we can all make an informed decision. So thank you to you. Amazing. Thank you. Thank you so very much. And finally, we're going to hear from our Montclair mayor, my mayor, my friend, my comrade, Mayor Robert Jackson. Thank you, Dr. Baskerville. Um, first of all, let me just say that uh, I don't know how many people are know, know Frank. I, I've known Frank uh, all his life. Yeah. And um, <laughs> keep an eye on this young man. Yep. Uh, he's an outstanding uh, person, uh, smart as a whip and really has a commitment to the community. And I wanted to just thank you, Frank, for participating yeah. tonight and for the yes. stuff you're uh, I, I have to say about, I don't know, 30 seconds into Lieutenant Governor's uh, speech, I realized I'm so far over my head in this thing. I don't know. <laughs> uh, this is this is a, uh, a a very interesting topic. You know, here we spend a lot of time talking about paving roads and curbs and fire trucks and things along those lines. Uh, this is a much more um, uh, erudite uh, uh, topic, but it's, it's it's really fascinating to hear the discussion and, of course, the implications that it has for local uh, government and for the the resources here. Um, uh, to be perfectly candid, I'm, so, I'm still formulating my opinions on the issue, um, and, and some of the comments that I heard from our distinguished panel really make me uh, even uh, a little bit more, a little less sanguine in terms of how I view the, the subject. Um, <coughs> but I'm hoping tonight between the questions that we get uh, from the audience and the comments that we get from the audience and what we will hear more from our, our panel, um, it will help me to form my opinion. Um, I just want to say, too, how much I admire uh, Dr. Baskerville uh, for pulling this all together and your leadership on this issue. Um, it's not easy to get this kind of a, a group uh, together, and you're to be commended for, for doing that. So congratulations. 
Um, uh, with that, I know people want to get to questions and, and comments, so I'll, I'll cut my comments off of that. But I do want to thank you all so much for coming out. This is a great showing, and um, I think it demonstrates the interest on the topic, and I'm looking forward to uh, learning and uh, expanding my knowledge on this subject. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mary Jackson. Okay, um, it's about 8.30. We're scheduled to adjourn um, at 9, and we're going to do the best that we can um, for whatever time we have. I don't know if any of the panel members have to leave at a certain time but and I'm not going to just like kick somebody out I'm just saying that so when you come to um, the mic that, that you're mindful now we have um, at least one one page full of people that would like to say something but I'm, I'm glad that you're here we're going to begin with um, um, attorney Imani Oakley here you are hello and thank you hey you you Good evening, everyone. Good evening, Good evening everyone. Uh, so my name is Imani Oakley, and I also am a. Uh, I was raised and born in Montclair, um, so I too am a member of the Republic, <laughs> People's Republic of Montclair, as I've learned it's affectionately called now. Um, and my background in drug reform uh, spent spans back a few years. So as a student at Howard University, I helped found the first um, Students for Sensible Drug Policy at Howard University, the first chapter there. Um, through my work with Students for Sensible Drug Policy at Howard, I also helped to um, start and uh, continue and eventually pass legalization in DC. Um, through that effort, I was invited by the Drug Policy Alliance to speak at their international reform conference as a panelist uh, and talk about how students and young people can get involved to affect drug laws in their area. Um, additionally, through that, I was invited to the Minority Cannabis Business Association's um, le legislative um, drafting process. And what they do, and this is probably the most important aspect of my background in this, is they construct model legislation that they say, okay, they bring around experts. So it's people who are attorneys, it's people who are teachers, it's people who are teachers, et cetera, all part of the um, drug reform movement. And what they do is they bring them all together and they say, if you could draft the perfect legislation, what would that look like? If you were to draft the perfect legislation on legalization of marijuana, what would that look like? And through that process, I learned two things. One, that the perfect legislation for this looks very much, it has two prongs to it. One, it has very, very, very strong aspects of criminal justice as far as expungements, as far as getting people back their rights to vote and various rights, just be giving back people those rights that were snatched from them due to the war on drugs. So that's one. And the second prong is, which is something I found very interesting tonight, we often talked about um, the economic aspect of marijuana as though it was separate from the social justice aspect. And what I would like to humbly ask all of you is to consider economics as a vital part of social justice. Um, when we think about equal pay as far as women, and when we think of equal pay as far as difference in race, we completely understand that economics is a vital, vital part of social justice and the fight for equality and equity in this country. And the legalization of marijuana is no different. Um, yes, it's true that in the past, in other states when they have legalized it, those who had the money to do it and who really di didn't come from communities who suffered um, from marijuana uh, drug laws, from unfair dr marijuana drug laws, did reap the benefits. But that's what gives us a unique opportunity here is that we can look back at their mistakes and say, what can we put in our legislation to make sure that those people who are from communities who are adversely affected can now come into the industry as business owners, legitimate business owners and entrepreneurs and start businesses for themselves and get back those economic opportunities that were lost for them. So um, with that, I would like to thank you all for having me tonight. And I would just really implore you to consider those things that I've said. I do have Yes. Uh, two comments. First, to, and, and of course to yours, but p first to Mr. Barnes. And this is the data from the Drug Policy Alliance, because they say that uh, social justice means that when we pass this, the racial disparity between those who use and those who are arrested, uh, that it will uh, cease. But we find, and this is from the Drug Policy Alliance, that um, 
The data shows that while legislation substantially reduced the total number of blacks and Latino people arrested, it did not eliminate the disparity. In every state, for example, in Alaska, even though the marijuana arrests plummeted in Alaska, the marijuana arrests for whites and black Americans dropped by nearly 99 and 93% respectively. But the author points out that Alaska's marijuana rate for black people is still 10 times greater than for white. Let's go to Colorado. Mm -hmm. The report found a similar pattern in Colorado. White people benefited the most from marijuana legalization. So while decreasing arrests, 51% for white people compared to 33% for Latinos and 25% for blacks. By 2014, the marijuana arrest rate for black people was nearly triple that of white people. The report found that the overall post-legalization arrest for black people in Washington, D.C. was reported to be double that of any other race. The report also found, and this is from the Drug Policy Alliance, uh, that a black person in D.C. is 11 times more likely than a white person to be arrested for public consumption. And this is reflected in both California and Nevada. And in Colorado, uh, they found that uh, legalized marijuana arrests for white children fell, but arrests for black children rose. For black children, For white children ages 10 to 17, because once it gets legalized, then the age goes down with respect to the people who are getting arrested. Listen to this. For white children age 10 to 17, the marijuana arrests fell by 9% between 2012 and the last year in which pot was illegal in Colorado. In 2014, the first year of legal pot sales for black kids of the same age, arrests went up by 52%, and for Hispanic kids, it rose by 22%. So that, um, and they talk about even the disparities in arrests are so massive that it is not the legalization of marijuana that will get rid of the disparities. So that one segment of social justice statistically is not borne out either for children or adults in the states that uh, it has been legalized. And the second, just the second, with respect to the um, uh, issue of empowerment, financial empowerment. The reason we can't have in New Jersey, and as we all know, set asides or anything that is both race, ethnic, or uh, by sex, is because set asides have been declared unconstitutional in the state of New Jersey. So you cannot have set asides because we have never done a correct disparity study to be able to show the result of race and gender on the participation in the economic field. So you can't have it, no matter what, and I have a, you know, I've met with uh, 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 the entrepreneurs. So that's not in this bill. But what is in this bill, and then I close, uh, about this impact zone. Mm -hmm. We don't know how they came up with the impact zone. They just threw together some numbers. And in fact, in caucus, and you'll remember, when there were certain cities that were not in the impact zone because by uh, uh, population, 
They went in the back room and just came up with a number that included the people they wanted to be in the impact zone. So the impact zone has two ways that you can, so let's say the impact zone, they tried to make it urban. And then in this bill, because this is what's going to be, this is what's going to move. This is what's going to be voted on. In the impact zone, there are two ways you can get a license. And what that means is that you just go to the head of the line of all other people who has license. But you still have to have the same money, right? You can't get a loan from uh, Chase Manhattan or uh, Bank America because it's still illegal mm -hmm. with respect to the federal government. Mm -hmm. So this is an all cash business. Yep. But let me tell you how you can get these impact zones which are supposed to be the social justice. One, if you live in an impact zone for three years, then you can uh, get points and jump ahead with the license. You still have to have the money and everything. So you live in East Orange. But you can open up this, use this license to cultivate any, in Mendham, in South Jersey, it is not restricted to the impact zone where you live. Or the second way to do it is that you live in Livingston. And you have the money, and what you say is, I want the benefits of a license under the impact zone. And you know what this law says? Fine. Just make sure you hire 25% of your, uh, your employees are from an impact zone any place. So what does that mean? That means that the wealthy and the rich, there is not one sentence in this bill about reinvesting in the community. Oh, wow. And so in the analysis, and I, uh, I ask you to read page 65 of the bill, <laughs> mm -hmm. from line 40 to 47 on to 66, there is not one wow. thing in this bill that calls for reinvestment in the affected area. And with the expungement, and then I'll finish, it is such a small amount to be expunged. Now, and I was a public defender during this time, and we know black and brown people were overcharged and overindicted. And we know that black and brown people were more likely to be charged with distribution of higher amounts. But in this bill, the limit for expungement is so small that it doesn't affect all those black and brown people who were overcharged and overindicted. And there is no data to determine if there's one ounce or more than one ounce. Who does it affect? If it's social justice, then who does it affect? My position, and then I'll close, is that if you're going to let rich folks come in and distribute marijuana and cultivate it, then you should wipe out the record of any and everybody charged with marijuana under any basis. So. So it's all, of, as I said at the beginning, it's all about the money. It's not about social justice. And I know that the, the, the questions have to come up, but let me give you two things. Jim Floyer, the former governor, went to the, one of the biggest licensed entities in the country to move to New Jersey. George McCross' brother, Phil McCross, went with the Boehner Group, former speaker, and they're promoting this stuff, and they're promoting all the seminars about the money. It's about money and not social justice. We can get social justice through decriminalization and we're gonna still have a problem with the expungements. Okay, next I'd like to call Catherine Allen Curry up. And, and line up over here to be Catherine, Lauren, Dave, Aloka, if I'm saying it incorrectly, you forgive me. Matthew, I can't read your writing, it looks like T-A-R-T-W-E-L-L. And Paul Nishimoto. So if you could line up here after the panel. Thank you for coming. 
thank you for having this forum. And I want to thank all of you for taking the time to come out yeah, and educating on. us. Oh, I just wanted to say thank you, Dr. Baskerville, for having this forum. And I want to thank everyone on the panel for coming. I don't have a question, but thank you, Senator Gill. Thank you. I've changed my mind. And I just wanted I just wanted to thank all of you for coming. I don't have a question, but it's very educational and I hope everyone has enjoyed it and I look forward to some of the questions that are coming. My daughter lived in a garden yeah, apartment. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, sorry. My daughter had a garden apartment when she was in college, and the man next door was smoking marijuana. And that's how we learned that the active ingredients in marijuana travel through walls. She was suffering all of the side effects of smoking marijuana. He was doing the smoking. Many neighbors were calling because of problems with his behavior, but he picked on her and smashed her car window. And that was the only time the management of the complex decided there was a problem. The man was eventually evicted, but the psychological damage to my daughter lasted a while. I spoke with people at work who said when they were in college, everybody knew that if anyone on a dorm floor smoked pot, everybody smoked pot. You can't get away from the active ingredients. It goes through walls. So when you talk about restricting the use of marijuana, you're going to have to have concrete bunkers for your recreational use. I'm very pleased to say that I have noticed it's hard to smell the odor of tobacco in Montclair. I'm always delighted because I'm allergic to tobacco. I'm also allergic to marijuana. And I will be delighted if our legislators pay attention to the facts and keep the air clear. Thank you. Well, um, <laughs> in, 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 in response to that right quickly, what the people here should know also, that's why I say it's a lot of information parents don't know what's going on in their homes. Young people now are vaping marijuana. They're eating it also. But when they vape it, there's no odor to it, and it creates even more problems psychologically because of the increased um, TCs and the potency of it. And so this, when, you, when someone mentioned adult, you can't talk about adult marijuana without involving the kids the daycare centers, the public schools, because those statistics are out there too, but we don't want to talk about them because then people will be saying no. I'm sorry. To fight against and argue against? I, I don't know where you're coming up with this kind of statements. you have facts to address this? Yeah, we have, uh, we have facts to address it. We have arrest about records to address it. smoke have and all this stuff. I didn't say secondhand smoking. What I what I said about her secondhand smoking, she when she mentioned secondhand smoking, and that's why you need to maybe kind of wake up a little bit, because I what she what up. she what she said was, she said secondhand smoking, yeah. right, and then she talk about odor, and what I'm saying is that they are vaping now. Well, you don't get the same smell. That's all I'm saying. I'm not going to debate it. Okay, I'm sorry, but the vaping you're talking about parents not knowing about their children vaping. The responsibility for who consumes cannabis under 21 lies with the parents. It's not a legislative, excuse me, I'm talking. It's not a legislative responsibility. Parents have to take control of their children, whether it's alcohol, opiates, or cannabis. So you cannot use that as a legitimate argument. I'm sorry. Thank you very much. And now I'm going to um, call the next person up. And, and I'd also like to ask, please, 
um, for the day is as well. If you'd like to um, offer an opinion, would you please let me know so that I can identify you as well? It's hard for me to keep up, and I'm, I just want to make sure that I'm able to, to hear you as well. Thank you. Um, so uh, that brings us to Dave Aloka, and followed by Matthew Catwell. Thank you for all your time. Um, basically, my question, um, or all right, my question uh, is basically to the lieutenant governor and the uh, senators. Um, basically, uh, with the bill you're trying to get through, are you looking more for standardization or regulation on your bill, which basically is for people who have had or have um, felonies or convictions, are they going to be allowed to open small businesses or are you going to give this to the big businesses and let the big businesses come in and line everybody's pocket and take away the small business people who can't do this because of this, their, their felony records and convictions in the past that have nothing to do with now and for a joint or for an ounce of weed. Um, that's my question. Are you looking more towards standardization or um, what I said before. I'm not a very good speaker. That's all right. Um, I, I would say to you that um, while this had been, you know, a, prim a, a priority of the legislature, a, a if we turn the clock back a year ago, that was one of the priorities the legislature and the governor's administration wanted to move. You're raising issues that are still not settled. And that is con that continues to be discussion with the 80 members of the General Assembly and the 40 members of the Senate. The issue you are raising is certainly an issue that is, is very important to social justice organizations like the NAACP and the New Jersey Institute of Social Justice. Um, when the um, even the applications for recreational, I mean for medicinal and the health department just solicited applications for medicinal. The state was going to issue six new licenses. That was a big part of the debate. The issue, and, and to, to, to borrow from Senator Rice's uh, language, vocabulary, he spoke about hedge fund managers who have tons of money and Correct. would they be given an entrepreneurial opportunity versus someone who didn't have access to capital. That continues to be part of what has to be deliberated on by everyone in this discussion. I will tell you that there is an organization called the, um, the uh, Urban Mayors Association and this is an issue that is very important to the mayor, to to the mayors of urban communities, that that there be the ability of uh, people to be able to participate in this industry and not just working in a quote grow house, but to have entrepreneurial ownership. And uh, when they did expand the uh, applications for medicinal, people knew they would not get a number of points if they did not have either a woman, an African American, a Latino, an Asian American, an Arab American uh, in the leadership of that business. And I think that that is something that is still being discussed and deliberated on, but it is of priority to many people that are in the legislature, that I know, as a former legislator. Thank you very much. I'm not, I'm not sure if it's a priority, primarily because if you keep reading the newspaper every day, they say they're going to have a bill by the end of the month. Of all you heard up here, you cannot have a bill by the end of the year. And so that's once again the smoke and mirror stuff. And that's why I said when I started, it's like promise in particular black folks, 40 acres and a mule again, we'll never see it. The business, we passed the bill right now. The big businesses I just named are going to control all the licenses. We'll never get social justice because we're going to have a committee to work on it. And it's still already told us to take seven, eight years to even look at a sponge and get it right. Thank you. The state cannot offer any kind of legal, uh, uh, any kind of financial assistance. Right. So this is not as if you have set aside. 
the state cannot uh, at all give you any kind of seed money because uh, this because the state has not contributed anything to it. So it's not a set aside where the state says, if you want to do business with us and get our money, you have to have X and Y, a black, a woman. But because the state is simply giving a license, but the state is not giving any financial benefit, like buying products from the state, there's not a set-aside program to give you money. So you must go to the hedge fund people or, you know, your grandmother got a sock someplace up under the bed. They got a whole lot of money. <laughs> yeah, and then that's the way you get it. There's no financial support at all. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very, very much. much. So the next thing we have, Matthew Catwell. Uh, just before Mr. Catwell comes out, I just um, there's a major water main break on Bloomfield Avenue by North Willow. So on the way home, try to avoid that wow. area. Thank you, man. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hello. Uh, Hello. I don't know if this is working properly. I, okay. Uh, I'm here because I have personal experience with this arena. I lived in Los Angeles for four years. I was a medical marijuana patient while living out there. They were wise enough to give me the opportunity to get a prescription because of my ADHD, as well as severe stomach issues that do not give me oh, the opportunity to eat. I sometimes get nauseous, all that. Uh, I moved back to New Jersey because my mom was about to undertake a very severe uh, spine surgery. and. The doctors were very much pushing for her to start an opioid treatment, and I did not want that to happen. I knew that Montclair had a dispensary. My fiance and I chose Montclair so we could have a close proximity for my mom. Uh, her back is severe enough that when she drives from Dumont, I hope everyone knows where Dumont is. Um, <laughs> when she drives from Dumont, she cannot drive back immediately. She has to rest in my apartment because it's that severe of a back problem. Uh, I can honestly say that the medical marijuana practices in the state of New Jersey uh, are not sufficient enough. And I ask you guys to keep a couple of things in mind. One, we can't use fear to make these decisions. We have to use logic. We have to use reason. Don't let hearsay determine what you're going to think about this. Talk to people who have personal experiences. When I walked into those dispensaries in LA, I did not just walk in. I had to go through a lobby that had a security guard that had me check my driver's license, leave any bags on the uh, side so that it couldn't be brought in. They were immensely secure and it prevented the possibility of someone underage getting in there or someone who was not properly supposed to be going in there because they did it right and that's what the opportunity is here. I know we look at other states, what they did wrong, we can be better. We have the opportunity to learn from these other states. One of the things you guys are doing are the proposal of lounges. A lot of the problems with driving in states where it's legal is because people who are tourists don't have a place to go. They wind up eating a brownie, which I can tell you from personal experience, sh you should not be behind the wheel of a car on a brownie. You have to have a safe place so that this can be stuff we can prevent. And I understand the social problems, that's immensely important. But lack of information is going to make it that we're not going to make the proper decisions. You're right. If you want to open a dispensary, you are going to have to go get a loan. You're going to have to get, but things like growing marijuana are something that you can start with $250 in your pocket. It is an opportunity to lift yourself up. Well, that's, I'm comparing California, of course. Of course not in this state, no. <laughs> Sorry, I should have stipulated that. I apologize. Um, but I'm saying there are things we can do to be better than other states that give everyone economic opportunities so we can lift ourselves out. I'm kind of, we're living in a world right now where politicians are using fear all the time. Let's be better than that. Let's not let fear of what might happen. If we're smart and we use proper security and we make sure these places are given the opportunity to succeed, we can prevent problems with children getting these underage things. States that have legalized 
a lot of these kids now aren't smoking weed. They're smoking these jewel things that are packed with nicotine. They just, they just literally had a court case where they determined one of the families ru running these companies was packing it with nicotine to make it as addictive as humanly possible. When you look at marijuana smoking, there are different ways to do it. Vaporizers do not have a secondhand effect. They also save you from all the nicotine problems that are in the papers when you smoke. There are healthy ways to do this if we're smart and give people the opportunity. So let's give each other the opportunity to make the smart decision. Giving you the opportunity, we have to realize, too, that since it's a federal crime, uh, you cannot, uh, you can be evicted from any federally subsidized housing, senior citizen housing, uh, when you have vouchers. Uh, and, uh, you know, I would hate my mother used to live at 56 Walnut. I did hate the fact that Mama had a, a gummy bear and got evicted because you don't realize. And uh, you can also, if even if you use medical marijuana, the federal government says that you can be evicted from uh, any kind of uh, federally funded housing and you can be denied uh, an apartment. So there are consequences that happen to poor people that are not the same consequences that happen to other people. Well, there are also, for business owners, the Small Business Association now does not allow anyone to get a loan if your company touches the yeah. cannabis industry. That means if you're an electrician and you service a dispensary or a grow facility, if you're a plumber and you take care of the water there, anyone who touches, so the government is looking to really mm -hmm. keep you yeah. down yes. okay, by, thank you by very taking much. off and that so access. Now I would like to call Paul Nishimoto, Colleen Martinez, Denise Coburn, and uh, Deborah Jennings in that order, please. Thank you, sir. It's 9 o'clock and I'm really trying to. Um, get as many people up here that have questions or a statement that they like to make. Hello. Um, uh, I wasn't born in Montclair, but I have lived here for 31 years, and I've been very pleased to do so. I'd like to first first comment that uh, I, I, if you, you know, what I would like to rely on, on you to make a, a reasoned decision on this. Uh, I don't want there to be a statewide vote. I don't want to end up like, with a, a, some kind of a Brexit situation like we're looking at in England. <laughs> Uh, and I'd also, in, in my view, the only really compelling reason for, for going ahead in the short run versus the long run would be a social justice issue. So I'd encourage you to, to fight on for what you think it needs to be done as long as you need to. Uh, and I do have, uh, uh, I'd like to say that I am a supporter of medical marijuana, uh, but I do have some concerns about uh, uh, legalizing it for other use, and I do have two c questions that I'd like to throw out uh, in case anyone has any comments. One is, uh, it sounded as though uh, it's more difficult for a law enforcement to deal with someone who's driving while they're intoxicated with marijuana as opposed to alcohol, and I was wondering if, if that could be further addressed and whether that could be mitigated somehow in case it's, uh, marijuana is legalized. And the second thing is, uh, I'm wondering, again, I guess the issue was just brought up about the difference between potentially legalizing it in the state and it being a, a problem the federal government and whether or not we can uh, sort of trust the current administration not to somehow penalize the state of New Jersey or other states that, uh, that legalize marijuana uh, if we were to proceed. Whereas, frankly, on the second issue, uh, I would have been less worried with other presidential administrations. I do. Um, Real quickly on the... THC, oh, she got it? Okay. Okay. THC stays in oh, okay. your system I I for a positive drug that. test. Can you hear me? THC yeah. stays in your system for a positive drug test for two to three weeks. So although the effect of marijuana is no longer there, the test is going to be positive. And so 
how you actually um, adjudicate that and from our prosecutors um, standpoint is going to be a little bit difficult I'll take question number one briefly it is more difficult to prove a driving under the influence of marijuana case as opposed to an alcohol case because in New Jersey we have an alcohol test which is a machine that you blow into and it reflects how much your blood alcohol level is and with marijuana it's uh, I have to have a drug recognition expert for example uh, to help me to show that the person was impaired uh, hopefully we have a urinalysis or a blood test or something like that standardized field sobriety tests it's it's more difficult process because we don't have a machine to measure it and as they said the, the, it stays in your blood for two to three weeks so I could get pulled over uh, two to three weeks after consuming it and, and if they were using those standards I would be guilty of DUI yeah. would not be impaired at all so that's just that they have to figure that out I have to improve that you're impaired it's right. not just enough to have it in your system right yeah Dr. Page. Um, uh, next, I'd like to call Colleen Martinez, uh, followed by Denise Cobham and Deborah Jennings. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Good evening. I'm Dr. Colleen Daly Martinez. I'm not a physician, however, I do hold a PhD in social work, and I'm a proud 21-year um, resident of Montclair. Thank you, Dr. Baskerville, for bringing us together. For timely and important conversation tonight and thank you all for being here despite your busy schedules I really appreciate it I have some brief comments to share with you um, when we speak about legalizing adult recreational use of marijuana I think we should remind ourselves that we're talking about adults we're not talking about children in addition to speaking about legalization we're speaking about regulation we're not talking about illegal drug dealers accepting food stamps in exchange for drugs we're talking about businesses that I have no doubt in addition to being heavily taxed this is New Jersey remember it will also be rigorously overseen to ensure the purity and safety of the product adults who are interested in using marijuana right now in New Jersey they can do so but there are many more risks with it being illegal one benefit that has not been discussed this far, thus far tonight is the fact that once it's legalized, it will actually be a safer product. Purchasing marijuana illegally now puts people m at much more risk of violence, crime, and exposure to other substances, as illegally purchased marijuana can be cut or laced with other substances. For those who are concerned about the safety of adult use of marijuana, I encourage you to reflect upon your concerns about other legal substances, including alcohol, cigarettes, and prescription opiates. If we're talking about wanting to keep the people of New Jersey alive and safer, we should meet again here tomorrow night to talk about what we can do about legal alcohol, legal cigarettes, and legal prescription opiates. If you're genuinely concerned about the safety of marijuana, I'd be very happy to share with you peer-reviewed scientific studies on the safety and dangers of cigarettes, alcohol, prescription opiates, and marijuana. I'm so very grateful to Dr. Page for sharing her medical and scientific knowledge, informing us that the dangers of responsible adult use of marijuana are relatively few. I'm grateful to the elected officials who are here tonight and those who are working hard to make sure that the legislation is appropriate and that it prioritizes the social justice issues, including expungement and the disproportionate impact of marijuana arrests in communities of color. I agree that this legislation should not be hurried for the benefit of big business. Wealthy white people have had plenty of opportunities in our country but that you should be cautious in your deliberations and legislation to ensure that communities of color can be in the ground floor of this new business opportunity. Legalized marijuana is in our future. Let's make New Jersey be on the right side of history with how we make it happen. Hi, my name is Denise Cobham. I'm an outsider. I'm not from Montclair. I'm from South Orange. Good evening, honorable honorables. Okay. Um, this is truly a watershed moment in New Jersey. It's an opportunity to deliver social justice uh, along with a wealth for people who can already afford it. Um, legalization of the use and sale of possession of marijuana of a society a means to address endemic injustice to all citizens of the state who have been victimized, marginalized, and rendered hopeless by injustice, unjust use of discretion by the criminal justice system. I'm a former 
a public defender for 20 years, a former Superior Court judge, and I am a baby boomer. Yes, I smoked marijuana. <laughs> Today's political reality is that the, New Jer the state of New Jersey cannot have one marijuana business without the other social justice. That is a political reality. And here's why. We have heard many times over the past 40 years, citizens, neighbors, psychologists, politicians, co-workers, religious leaders of all faiths, and judges invoke the mantra of personal responsibility. Taking personal responsibility. Who has taken personal responsibility for racism, segregated schools and neighborhoods, employment discrimination, environmental racism, sexism and sexual orientation discrimination, or wealth inequality that results from these institutionally created unlevel playing fields. No one takes personal responsibility uh, for some or all of the above, but a great deal of people have benefited from this social construct. What makes this potential marijuana legalization push a watershed moment is that this may be our last great chance where no one has to take personal responsibility for all of those horrible things I just named. Um, but going forward, we can implement societal responsibility by addressing uh, the disparate results. I ask everyone, and I recommend to everyone, reading the force report that was published by the Star Ledger or NJ.com. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. You. Um, welcome. I'm going to ask, please, that when you come up to the to the mic now, did everybody get that? It's the Force Report. The Force Report. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, and so it's now about nine. It's a little bit after, close to nine fifteen. Um, anyone that has leave, you know, feel free to do so. Um, any of our panelists that may have to go. Otherwise, I'd like to hear from Deborah Jennings. Uh, she's the next person in line, and then Trina Paulus. Uh, thank you, Councilwoman Baskerville, for having this forum. I've I had the opportunity to hear a lot about this issue, but I want to say that this is probably the most comprehensive forum that I've had an opportunity to participate in. Um, I want to particularly thank my legislators. Um, I want to particularly thank my uh, legislators um, and Senator Rice for really standing your ground for going against the um, for going against what is typically the sort of the party line and the line of the party leaders because if you don't do that, if you are not our um, if you are not are representing us and asking those hard questions and making those tough and informed statements, this will just fly through. Um, the, pre the freeholder board president has basically said what is probably the truth, which is it will happen, but it doesn't have to happen in the way that it is looking like at this point. And I'm, and I'm expecting you to really to stand up and to make sure that it is representative of what we really need to see. Um, the priority is decriminalization. The priority is um, to overhaul the expungement system so that it actually can work for people, to put the money into the system so that it isn't a system that is so onerous because of its being understaffed, under-resourced, just confusing and totally discouraging and it, for it takes people years to get through the system. And then I also would like to, uh, as in my role as the executive co-director of SPAN Parent Advocacy Network, where we work with families with children with disabilities, I would also like to um, ask our um, state representatives and also our local representatives to send resolutions to the federal government to expand the money for research around the 
uses and the medicinal benefits of marijuana because many of the families that I work with are finding that there are a lot of benefits, particularly in the areas of related to seizures and epilepsy, um, as well as a young man mentioned uh, ADHD. And, but the research isn't there enough for children, and so it makes it very difficult for children to get that, um, that kind of support. So again, thanks to all of you. Thanks for coming out and um, really giving us a real good uh, re research, research is impossible because it's a federally uh, illegal product. So the government does not allow testing on cannabis. So we can't do that research. Right now, Israel is the leader in world research on cannabis. And a few weeks ago, their, their government passed a law that allows the export of that research to other countries. So since we can't do that here, we have to depend on other sources, just to address that question. And one other thing about decrim, decriminalization is not a solution to legalization because it still makes it illegal. And so the government does not get any of the revenue that they will get from legalization. Taxes don't go anywhere. It all goes back to the black market. So one of the benefit decriminalization does not eradicate the black market. Right taxation, right pricing will when it's legal. Hi, I'm maybe representing this older generation. I'm the generation that try to keep my son from smoking and uh, had a deal with him when he had a one joint that he was 18 and three other younger kids were in the car. So I've been through this part from this side. I now want to take marijuana with the marijuana active ingredient, but I want to take it medically. And so I've been studying that. And I've, and I've listened to something you might like to go on and find something called the sacred plant. It was a six-part series that was on through the auspices of the John Robbins and Ocean Robbins group. And it was very, very useful. And in number five, I was particularly impressed with what was happening in California with medical marijuana after the legislation. And I just visited my son in marijuana. It's in, in California. It's all over the place. You can walk in any place and get it practically. It's just all over. But what the people who gave their sort of life's risking blood to help people who needed it for seizures and all the other medical things, those people, the doctors, were on this program. And then number five, one of the problems that came up were the people who were doing this, I think, noble, like almost, it's what you do when you know it's the right thing to do, even though it's technically legal, illegal. That these people were voted against the legalization of marijuana for recreational purpose. I'm not, I don't know what, that sh what we should do, but they did vote against it because it was so important that they could keep up that careful work with medical marijuana, which meant that they were able to change the dosages and change it around. And it wasn't like buying supplements in a store where, where now it's pretty standardized. They can't do that anymore under legalized marijuana. So I found that a very interesting thing since I have glaucoma, I want to I use it now. I never smoked it, by the way, but I want to use it now. And I want to be able to do it very carefully. I'm not trying to get high. I want to use it. And when I hear the pitfalls of what, the 48, 48 pages? I haven't done that. So just want to say that the, the sacred plant series might be something you want to look into. Thank you. Okay, and so um, at this point in time, I would like to uh, close with, um, the, uh, with the last two people. I, I'm going to call um, Councilman Bob Russo, and I'm going to call the um, Deputy um, Mayor of Montclair, Sean Spiller. And I know there's, we're only about halfway through the list. And I, I apologize. I don't want to be rude to people that have carved out a certain window uh, for here. people. We're if here. you're here. willing, I, I don't. Yeah, I don't know about our lieutenant governor and the rest of the panel. But the lieutenant governor, yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> then we're good. We're good. Then I just wanted to make sure because 
I know um, there's never been a time that I can remember when any of the people up on the panel have not come when I when I've reached out to them. And the last thing that I would want to do is disrespect their time. So if they're good with it, I've got nothing but time. So thank you guys. Somebody give me the thumbs up when you're ready to quit. Okay, so we're back at it. Um, and this is um, Councilman Bob Russo. Thank you, Renee. I was leaving because my mom is 99 going on 100, and she's suffering from terrible, terrible arthritis, crippling, mm -hmm. and she's got glaucoma. Now, she and I, neither one of us have ever smoked even cigarettes. I hated cigars my father used to smoke. I would never even smoke any of this stuff. But my mother needs help, and marijuana has been a very, very good program here in Montclair. I think we've had seven years of no problems. I served on a panel, as some of you know, that was held in Plainfield a few years ago, a few months ago, with our police chief. And the key thing that we kept telling the folks on that panel, not we're for or against it, but we're giving you a report that with the medical marijuana program, Greenleaf Compassion Center Monker, there hasn't been any complaints or problems. So we've totally supported medical marijuana. And the expansion of that to legal adult use is something I do support. I have all the same reservations and concerns that Senator Rice, who I respect tremendously, has. But I definitely want to see us legalize so that we can do two things. Get it out of the black market. Get it out of the hands of the wrong people. Have it controlled very strictly, very strictly controlled by our state. And have people get access who might need more because sometimes medical marijuana has been restricted to certain conditions. Now, the one thing I have reservations about in this bill, and I don't know whether the bill has been changed, Senators, we have to have in Montclair, if this is sold, if this is allowed in Montclair, we have to have the revenue to enforce the law and make sure nobody is using it who shouldn't. This is, this is a very important thing to me. 5% tax is what I would advocate rather than just 2%, which I heard was in the bill. So we really have to do something to make sure our police force has adequate funding to enforce the law and to make sure we don't have any problems. Thank you. Thank you very much. You know, Councilman, as, as you leave and the other councilmen come up, let me say this to you. Um, they, 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 you people keep confusing the medical with the recreation. That's why I don't like these, these panels and these conversations. We're, we're with the medical piece. That's number one. Number two, if you look at all the states, these edible facilities, retails, not dispensers, they're retail, they just call them dispensers, they're put in the minority communities, and that's why you're having the problems. And if it came to Montclair, it'd probably be near Grove Street. I can assure you that, even with you on council. Um, I said Grove. I said Grove Street. Okay. Yeah, um, yeah. Now, yeah, at the base. So, so I just want to be, be clear. It's, it's where you place them, et cetera. So, so I just, you know. Sorry, Well, thank you, Councilwoman Baskerville, for putting this together. Thank all of you. I mean, I, I walk in and I see who's up here. It is so impressive. And, and to hear the, the diverse group of opinions that are here, I think it really speaks for the conversation that we are having as a state right now, certainly as a, as a, as a community around this issue. Uh, I personally, I think anyone who uh, watched the uh, last council meeting or have seen anything, um, I am on the record. I support uh, legalization. Uh, and quite frankly, I do so first and foremost coming at this from the perspective of when I look out right now, I see that in many instances, individuals who want to acquire marijuana can do so. Unfortunately, they're doing so from individuals who are offering other drugs or, or doing a lot of other pieces to it. And I think we've got to also look at this issue. When I hear a lot of the concerns that have been put forward, I think they're all valid. Uh, we've got to make sure we do this responsibly. I think you've heard that from everybody up here. There are certain pieces in the bill as it exists now that don't offer the right incentives to certain communities, don't offer uh, the pieces that we feel are needed for social justice. But that does not change the fact that right now we are disproportionately affecting individuals of color with the laws that exist now. We are in a system where the laws and the impact are doing more harm than the drug itself. And to me, at the core, that means something is wrong, and we've got to try and fix it. What that looks like, I am confident, because I know that Senator Rice's vote, ne vote is needed, Senator Gill's vote is needed to make sure this happens, that when they're engaging in compromise, which is government, and they're figuring out a way to move forward responsibly, they're going to be our voice fighting for the things that we need in this bill. But at the core, we've got to do something, because the status quo, it, quite frankly, is just unacceptable. 
So I am supportive. I know that, again, everybody wants to see it done responsibly. We need the dollars, as my council colleague noted, to make sure enforcement is done properly. We need to make sure we're addressing the different components around social justice. When we talk about records, expungement, et cetera, these things have got to be addressed. We've got to talk about it. We've got people who are knowledgeable doing so. But we've got to make changes. We've got to do something. And that's why I stand in support. So I thank all of you for engaging in this conversation. I thank you for what each of you bring to this. Uh, and I know that we're going to get it right together. So thank you again. Okay. Navdeep, um, then Maureen Edelson, Sharon Kaki, and William Statt. Uh, okay. When it comes to uh, legalizing cannabis in New Jersey, um, per the social justice issue, I don't think jobs are enough. I don't think equity is enough. I think we need to earmark cannabis tax revenue dollars and reinvest them into these communities that have been impacted. Um, if you look at the war on drugs and the implications that it has on the society, it's de decreased the human capital value within these societies. That means we've relegated them to low economic paying jobs, jobs in security, uh, lack of investment in social and economic <coughs> infrastructure within their communities. So if we're going to be, if we're looking for true solutions, we need to earmark these monies and reinvest them into these impacted communities. Now, what does that mean? That means subsidizing the cost of child care services for single parents. That means creating apprenticeship programs because not everybody gets to go to college. Not everybody has access to credit. That means uh, creating tech centers or computer labs because one in five teens in, t in, t in lower economic communities don't have access to stable internet or computers. So these are the different factors that I think that we can make an, imp uh, an effect on. And uh, one other point is if expungement's going to cost, then I think cannabis tax revenue dollars should eliminate those costs and take care of those costs. So those are some of the points I want to acknowledge, and I hope you guys take into consideration, because we will increase the economic value of these communities by giving them stability and, and the stability to pursue the opportunities they deserve as Americans. Well, thank you, uh, Councilwoman Baskerville, for putting this wonderful panel together. And um, I want to mention to Lieutenant Governor Oliver and to the audience, if you pull out your phones right now, go to your Facebook page, you can actually like the page for the People's Republic of Montclair. <laughs> there is a Facebook page, if you would kindly let the governor know and invite him to like it as well. It's a lot of fun, and it's the perfect description for our special town. Um, I, I need to uh, uh, really express my appreciation for every one of you on this panel, uh, the vibrant and thoughtful conversation on this very important subject uh, is at the best level possible. And on social media today, I sent out um, as many uh, posts as could to encourage our young people to come tonight because this is the type of uh, process for them to learn from in order to be able to start making informed decisions for the rest of their lives. And whether that is as young people or as young adults or when they themselves are parents or legislators or business owners. So uh, I hope in the future many people will bring their young adults with them to forums such as this. Um, I wanted to mention uh, that as many of you on the panel know or in the audience, I'm very concerned about a youth and uh, the social fabric of the community, especially a community such as Montgomery that was built around providing a healthy uh, community for our families and our children and, um, and maintaining the social fabric as the mayor knows that I do through scouting a great deal. Um, and one of the concerns that I've had is the apparent fraying of the social fabric as our society modernizes, moves away from traditional institutions. And um, we've had things go on over the years uh, that are a little um, uh, indicative of a frayed social fabric. Last year, we had the murder of three women in Montclair. Um, it's a very difficult situation. People are not willing to speak about it. But I do get concerned about the intersection of some of these forces. And I wonder, Mr. Angelo, if you could mention if marijuana or any other 
uh, mind-altering substance was involved with the alleged perpetrators of those crimes. Thank you. The reason I uh, spoke earlier about my jurisdiction is because I want everyone to understand that as the municipal prosecutor, I'm responsible for prosecuting disorderly persons offenses. So I was not involved in that process. That will be the Essex County Prosecutor's Office. Um, so I'm not sure if there was any type of hallucinogens or anything involved in that. Those are indictable offenses. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you very much. Should and you know, earlier tonight they mentioned Andrew the accident in Wayne. Guest and William Scott, please, in that order. I would like to thank Councilwoman Renee Baskerville for organizing this event and to the Lieutenant Governor and all of the other members of the panel. Thank you so much for giving your time and for bringing you listening to who are working on the 9 o'clock hour. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Sharon Cocky and I'm an attorney. I have a certificate background in health care providers. Right, okay. Hi, my name is Sharon Cocky. I'm a lifelong resident of Montclair. I'm an attorney and I have a significant background in healthcare compliance as well as policy development. My concern is that the senators, both Senator Gill as well as Senator Rice, have mentioned that expungement is going to take quite some time. So my concern is with along with expungement come other factors that need to be considered because when people are released, where are they going to live? Where are they going to work? Um, the housing is going to be a problem. Is there some sort of organized effort to come together and, and bring resources so that when people's records are expunged, they won't be discriminated against in housing, that they will be able to get jobs, that there will be some kind of training or something to help transition them, especially people who have been there for long periods of time, um, as, as well as what would happen with cases that were pending. My other concern is that being in healthcare, most employers in the healthcare field require drug testing. So once this is legal and people feel that they're doing it in a legal manner, but they apply for a job, they could not get hired or if, if testing is done randomly, they could get fired. So I think that there's other factors that need to be considered that this is not going to be the end all decision for everyone in terms of it's going to be a free for all in terms of smoking marijuana because there's going to be a lot of other possible consequences and repercussions that have not been uh, thought about. But I did want to know, is there going to be any kind of organized effort to help people transition from, from jail to housing to jobs and other factors in society? Thank I think that's much, generally Lieutenant. under reentry program. Oh, I'm oh, I'm sorry. Yes. I'm I, sorry. I want to respond to the housing piece because uh, in my role as the commissioner of the Department of Community Affairs, and as commissioner, one of the things I have prioritized with our division of housing and community development is focusing on housing for returning citizens. Uh, what, one of the agencies attached to uh, DCA is the New Jersey Housing Mortgage Finance Agency. And uh, we are looking at some housing models from the state of Kansas, whereby the state has stepped up and he's begun to get involved in housing for those returning after incarceration. We know the difficulties of people in acquiring houses. Often landlords do not want to rent, um, you know, to people who have been incarcerated. So as we speak, we are working on the development of some housing uh, HMFA will work with us as some of the other related state agencies to specifically develop housing for those who are returning after periods of incarceration. One of the things that I am engaged in as the commissioner is working in the city of Atlantic City. And we have a phenomenal opportunity with uh, some stakeholders in Atlantic City and we are working on the development of housing for returning citizens attached to a job in the casino industry in Atlantic City. One of the things that has uh, always precluded ex-offenders were some of the rules and regulations that have been promulgated by the Casino Control Commission and the Division of Gaming Enforcement. But we are working on that as we speak. We have the, the uh, commission 
Department of Corrections at the table. We've got HMFA at the table. We've got um, Volunteers of America and other uh, other situ instances, institutions. But we are totally focused upon uh, housing for people returning to communities who have been incarcerated. That is very rewarding to hear. Oh, sorry. No, thank you very much. I think um, Senator Gill, did you want to say I something? Is that so you? Companies set the policy. They don't allow drinking at work. They're not going to allow smoking at work. I mean, it, it's really up to the company to set that standard. Because it's legal doesn't mean you're okay to smoke at work. Okay, Andrew President Weingast. Oh. The Senate President said and that. Now we're uh, going to go into the, the lightning round, and yeah. everybody's going to get one minute that comes up here to have a question yeah. after we hear from Senator Rice. Senator Rice has some comments. We're in the, the lightning round. The Senate President round. said because the businesses were concerned that he would leave it in for them to fire but there was a Burlington County court case that said that they'd be fired anyway. One of the problems in Colorado and other states, they said that they have problems hiring people because they're drug testing and they go outside the state when they bring people in the state after they stay there a while they drug test and there's going to be a lot of legal lawsuits. The final thing that was mentioned by the young lady, when you talk about housing, and this is why I said that the legislature should slow this thing down and get all the information and we should know the information we debated. Is that when you when you when you increase when you legalize recreational marijuana, every place we legalize it, the number of homeless population has increased substantially in those municipalities. Mm -hmm. And so you're talking about reentry housing for people, but there's another population coming in, so you're going around in circles and you need that need to be looked at and addressed before we do recreation. Thank you, Senator. I'd like to call Andrew Weingast, followed by Mr. William Scott. Followed by um, Hanan Koko, if I'm saying that right. And we're down to the lightning round. One minute each. Thank you. Uh, hi, tonight, folks. Uh, my name is Andrew Weingast. I am a U.S. Army veteran as well as a patient advocate. Uh, I used to be employed at the dispensary here in Montclair, Greenleaf Compassion Center. Uh, you know what? Actually, let me turn this way. Uh, everybody that I need to talk to right now is sitting in front of me. Everybody behind me here already has their position. I'm not going to change the ones that are not on my side and the ones that are on my side. They can listen just as well. Uh, I've been in the medical marijuana industry for about seven years now. I have seen everything from seizure disorders, cancer, AIDS to less similar conditions, anxiety, ADHD. And the one thing that I haven't really heard discussed tonight is the impact that legalization will have on these patients. Legalization will bring lower prices to patients that currently are barred from the system. We have heard a lot of these elected representatives stand here and tell us how they supported the medical marijuana bill, but when it's come to actually supporting the medical marijuana program, that hasn't been there. We have talked about tax exemption for medical marijuana patients. Medical marijuana patients are currently paying a 7% sales tax on all of the medicine that they buy. It is cheaper for a New Jersey patient to fly to Colorado purchase two ounces worth of medicine, fly back, even though all of this is against federal law, and you know consume their medicine here, than it would be for them to purchase their legal monthly allotment in the state of New Jersey. I am a medical marijuana patient. I use medical marijuana for my post-traumatic stress disorder as well as my seizure disorders. I cannot afford the medicine in this town. I have to drive all the way down to Cranberry, which is a real pain for me because I don't have a car anymore. That is the only dispensary in this state where I can afford my medicine. If you bring recreational marijuana to the state of New Jersey, there's a lot of problems that we're going to have. There's a lot of solutions that are going to be found. The important thing that we need to worry about right now is doing this properly. Thank you very much. I appreciate that very much. Very good. Okay. 
Um, did anybody wish to offer anything after that? Okay, we're moving on to Mr. William Scott. This is lightning round. How are you, Mr. William Scott? This is my right arm. I, I love this gentleman. He, he supports me in everything I do. Thanks for being here. And thank you for this forum, and thank you, legislators. I, I just have a question from a, uh, a property owner uh, from a rental standpoint. And uh, you know, tenants and uh, owners have rights. Uh, I would like to have a, an environment from a property owner or renter standpoint that I don't want people coming, uh, renting property to people who smoke because it may have an effect on other tenants that don't want to be in that environment. And I'd like to know what type of legislation is going to be in place that I'm not discriminating against people or constantly in court trying to get someone evicted. And I guess I'd have to take a look at it from both perspectives, not only from a, an adult marijuana use uh, standpoint, but also from a medical use standpoint. Uh, if I have a tenant that doesn't want to deal with one or the other, I mean, I have an issue at that point. And I'd like to know what's in the bill to support that. Well, in the bill, it uh, allows the landlord to get or to deny. Uh, you know, okay. They can't okay. Oh. Okay. In the bill, it allows um, the landlord to not rent or uh, if they have rented to evict. Uh, and so there's the, it, 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 it covers, it appears to cover both smoking and ingesting marijuana. Okay. Oh, I've argued there's gonna be a lot of lawsuits, <laughs> primarily because we're saying it's legal, and we're allowing you to do something, so the government's backing off of it, but I'm gonna sue you anyway, win or lose, and take it up to the Supreme Court and listen to it. The same thing with the jobs, you tell me I got it in my system 30 days. I'm telling you that I didn't, I wasn't high on the job. I didn't create that, that accident because I was high. The union's gonna get tired of complaints coming. The union's gonna get tired of litigating and spending money, fighting employers. There's gonna be a lot of lawsuits. And actually, actually, and actually I see the lawsuit more on medical marijuana because the Americans with Disabilities Act. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you very much, Deidre Malloy. Then we're going to have um, Hanan Kolko and Selma Abdesevic. I first want to thank you, Councilor Baskerville, for holding this forum. I think it is really, really timely. And I appreciate each of you on the panel for being here. I only have a couple of statements. I want to thank you, Senator Gill, for reading the bill. Um, I'm a person that's in the weeds on stuff like that, but I think it's important for the public to really understand what we're up against, um, whether it's socially, economically, or regardless. And also, I would like to ask that each of you seriously consider the expungement process. I understand that's a, a serious thing legally, and I understand that it takes a long time, but it, I personally don't support the bill as it is. Um, I do think that at some point we need to legalize marijuana, but you know, there's a lot here that needs to be thought about and considered. Um, I happen to be on the board of Integrity House. I've been there for more than 10 years, and we deal with legislative issues, reentry, drug court, housing, all kinds of things. I mean, we are in the weeds on this stuff, and I, I just really appreciate <laughs> no pun intended. <laughs> I just heard what I said. <laughs> but we are. We're literally, and just like you all are. And so I just want to thank you for that. One thing I will say, um, this is a comment that my son had. He's 18, and he supports legalizing marijuana, okay, because most of them do. He says that um, with dispensaries or medical dispensaries, there should be some kind of a tracking system as to who's utilizing the, um, is that the case already? Okay. Okay, thank you very thank much. Thank you very much. Okay, we're still in the lightning round. We have Hanan Koko, then we have Selma Abdesevic, and Ben, Chef, Chef, how do you say it? Okay, thanks. Lightning round, thank you for being here. Thank you, Councilmember Baskerville. My name is Hannon Coco. I'm a 21-year resident of Montclair. My wife and I raised my kid here. He's MHS class of 2014. Full disclosure, I'm a lawyer. I represent a licensed uh, holder in New York State. I am with Cory Booker, who is the chief sponsor of the Marijuana Justice Act, which would make it legal at a federal level. And there are four main reasons 
why I urge all of the legislators up here to support legalizing cannabis in New Jersey. A, there is a racial justice aspect. The data is clear. Black people and white people smoke cannabis at the same rates. Black people get arrested more often. They get pr prosecuted more often. They are prosecuted with higher level offenses. They are incarcerated for longer times. And so the system is unfair and will always be unfair. The way to mitigate that is to make it legal. B, there is only a question of whether you're going to have a legal regulated industry or an illegal black market industry. It's not a question of whether you're going to have an industry or not. If you want to regulate it and keep cannabis away from 15 year olds, make it legal. Because right now, every 15 year old in Montclair can get it. And if you don't believe me, go down Park Street and go to the high school and find someone in the freshman cafeteria. Third reason, it will create an industry where you will have jobs, not only for people who work at the dispensaries, but for the HVAC guys who install the heating and cooling systems, and for the advertising people, and for all the ancillary projects. And fourth, there is a fundamental matter of freedom. Responsible adult marijuana users are all throughout this community. You will see us in hot bagels abroad on Valley Street. You will see us walking in Anderson Park on Saturday morning. We drive Hebrew school carpool. We go on Boy Scout camping trips. All we want is the same right on a Friday afternoon to go to a marijuana store in Montclair that people now have to go buy wine. It is all we want. So racial justice, development of an industry, fairness, and a regulated industry. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Okay. How are you? Good. We're at the one minute um, a person mark, and thank you for coming. Thank you for having me. Um, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming. I would like to thank specifically to Senator Rice, because if I was not, if I didn't see his name, uh, I would have assumed this evening was going to be rubber stamping of this bill, and I would not have showed up. And I'm glad I did, because I'm glad to hear these diverse opinions of my legislators. So thank you all for being here. Um, I have taken a couple of hours this afternoon to actually read through the bill, and there were a few things that came kind of jumping at me, social justice being one of them, but it having already been addressed by Senator Gill in more than appropriate language, I will not go back to that issue. Um, she has also mentioned that, and Senator Rice as well, that this would be illegal under the federal law and a Controlled Substance Act, and we keep forgetting that. Um, there are already 40 towns in the state of New Jersey that have local ordinances prohibiting opening of the marijuana dispensaries. There are two counties, and, and I know this is probably more political than anything else, um, that the freeholders in Ocean County and Monmouth County have also had an official ordinance, but it doesn't hold any water. Ha um, all of these things aside, what, what worries me is what comes after. Because we are coming into this unprepared. The bill states things like sales tax collection is supposed to be staggered in over the five year period, starting at sales tax 7% year one up to 25% in year five. Only 3% of this money is supposed to stay in the community that is actually housing this dispensary. This is absolutely not okay. I think this is completely inadequate amount of funds to stay in a community if we are using it, right? Thank you very much. Okay, so we have Ben Ch Chef to come up. No, I appreciate it. And if we have, if you guys have stuff and you want to pass it on in writing um, to, to anyone, we'll make sure that they get it. It is now almost 10 o'clock and we're going to wrap up at 10. So I'd like to give you an opportunity and then Daniel Gilmer and that should be it for the public comment. Hi, my, my name is Ben. I'm, my, I'm, <coughs> I'm a new member for the, in the community. So for my language, I'm still learning. I, I, I think you guys need to take some more time to understand where you're standing between decriminalization, legalization, medicalization, and social justice. I'm, I'm, I'm sitting here and I'm, I, I can hear a lot of fear and a lot of lack of data and very big headlines. 
I don't know if any one of you are familiar with uh, Professor, uh, Professor Rafael Meshulam. Professor Rafael Meshulam is a nominated professor for a Nobel Prize on his research on, on the cannabis field. He's the guy who find out about THC and he's the guy who found about the CBD. None of you here which are speaking about medical aspects, not even you, are talking about all those things which are very, very important because already now we know the effects on from helping chemo to epilepsy to all kind of disease that they can affect immediately. And as he said, in Israel they have a very, very big research in the hospitals and in, in the uni universities and they are focusing on the genetics and in the technology. You, n you have great universities, great labs, great students. Let them focus on finding a way so you will have the device to check out people like you do with alcohol. And you guys, you don't need to be afraid of it. You just need to find the right way how to do it and not to stop it because there's a huge wave of knowledge and industry that is coming. You won't be able to stop it. So just find the right way to do it for the benefits of everyone. I think what there is, first of all, we can't do the research We've are, because it's illegal. Secondly, all, my position is not based on fear. It's based on facts. And, that, and those facts are here to inform the community so that they are not subjected to other kind of fear tactics. And we can come together and make a uh, determined analyzed position, but I'm not afraid of anything. I am afraid of ignorance. Right. That's the only thing. All right, uh, Daniel Gilmer, and then I'm just going to um, ask our guest speakers if you all have anything that you'd like to say before we leave, and I express my gratitude, Mr. Daniel Gilmer. Good evening. Uh, thank you all for being here. Uh, as noted, my name is Daniel Gilmer. Also a proud Howard University graduate, you, <laughs> you know. Uh, as a father of four, uh, I care deeply about my Montclair community, uh, even serving on the planning board here, though of course I'm here representing only myself. Uh, as noted, um, the legislation needs to ensure both responsible use uh, and responsible implementation. Um, my main concern, of course, is for my uh, young children um, who will have to navigate our system uh, even now and in years to come. Uh, so I just wanted to encourage uh, everyone on the dais uh, to continue to focus um, on potential impacts that could be had to folks that it will not actually be legalized for. Um, and then secondly, to also do all that you can work, uh, all the work that you can do uh, toward expungement uh, of the records of those that uh, have already been impacted. Thank you. Great, thank you very, very much. And, and so clearly we have um, a lot of work to do. I'd like to thank all of you for coming out here um, tonight and I especially want to thank all of you for taking your time and beyond the time that, uh, that you expected. Uh, we have a lot more work to do um, and I know I certainly will continue to look at the facts, gather the data and to try to come to some reasonable um, decision. People ask me, well, why are you doing this on the municipal level? Because if it turns out that they decide to legalize that, then your local municipal elected officials will have some decisions that we want to make um, regarding if we wish to have dispensaries here or either if we want to opt out. And so it's been very informative for me to hear from you and to hear from the panel. We will have um, more discussions. This is not the end. Clearly, we need to have that. And I'd like to um, wish my colleague at the East Orange Early Childhood Department, Ms. Ernestine Johnson, a very happy birthday. Um, she decided to spend her birthday here with us today, and I thank you. Um, so if anyone on the panel would like to uh, say anything, we certainly would love to. Otherwise, I really appreciate it. I think you guys have, have been a godsend for this discussion. When I first started trying to plan it, I had no idea the magnitude and how we were going to get through this so I just appreciate you and you know there is one thing they may try to pull this bill and push it now we are here to take being very Montclair <laughs> <laughs> and then there's very Trenton <laughs> and so 
although you say we should take time, this bill can be pushed to come up next month mm -hmm. or the month after because of the politics that are uh, involved here. So we have to be vigilant. And the, uh, the things that you uh, think are important that are not in the bill, uh, call up the governor. Mm -hmm. Let Senate President Sweeney know. Let your legislator know. Mm -hmm. Because they are about to move a bill without any further discussion and without addressing the issues raised today. So we're going to be on it because no matter what they say, they have to get 21 senators to get it out of the Senate, which means, as we used to say when I was a criminal defense attorney, public defender, you got to come through me to get my client. So they have to come through us to get this bill. Thank you very much. Um, let, me, um, let, let, let me just thank you very much. Uh, Councilwoman Baskerville and to, to the audience and say to you um, my position is not going to change in terms of the information out there if you really research this stuff if, and I know you don't have the time every day new information is coming out that shows that we need to slow it down it's going to have impacts on our communities particular communities of color that may not mean much to the Senate president or other people um, I think the governor has a tiger by his tail and can't let it go because I mm -hmm. think in his heart he knows that it's going to do harm to our communities. I don't think it could be in discussion without preschool parents and parents of kids going to school because kids are going to be involved. I can show you all kinds of articles in New Jersey about things that's happening right now. I can tell you that the black market is going to be around so it's the street corner. When they stop doing the drugs in, in Colorado, the Mexican cartels are sending more heroin to the street now so the heroin use is going up. So I got marijuana increased use, heroin use, and methadone is on the rise in terms of production that was at a low. Even New Jersey, South Jersey, we have not legalized anything. And all of a sudden, methadone, let's talk to DEA, is on the rise in terms of production, and heroin is coming like crazy. You also, if you do the research, you'll find out that this thought about the opioid users transitioning to marijuana, um, they're not transitioning big numbers to marijuana. They are transitioning to heroin and meth. That's why production is up. And the final thing, I get tired of people telling me that marijuana don't kill you. Here's how they fake the public out. They tell you that you don't have the kind of overdose on marijuana that you have on other drugs. Marijuana kill you. When you get in that car and you drive down the street, whether it's alcohol or something else, and you hit someone and kill them, you create death. And so we shouldn't be trying to enhance bringing more substance into the community when we have enough substance now. And the final thing is giving the kids a bad message. I'm going to tell you what the subliminal message is. And this is why I get angry with, with adults, okay? The subliminal message is you cannot smoke. We can't smoke in public places. You can't do this. Don't drink alcohol. I have no problem coming back here trying to go back to prohibition, but we know that's not going to happen, so stop using it as a bounce offer for, for the marijuana. And so the message is, as a young person, you don't smoke, you don't do drugs, but it's going to be okay for you to do marijuana smoking, and if you get addicted, then we would treat you as long as we can make some money off you. And that is the subliminal message. And to me, coming from the civil rights movement, it's offensive. I don't care what my black colleagues say. I don't care what my white colleagues say. I don't care what the governor says or the leadership down there. They are wrong on legalizing this stuff. Decriminalization will give us social justice. They messed up on the bail reform. They did not listen to us. And they give me to mess up on this one, too, because the community is saying, well, we want it to come anyway. It cannot come without 21 votes, and it cannot come without 41 votes. And New Jersey is not Colorado. Okay. Thank you very much, Senator. Freeholder, did you wish to say anything? So just, just a thank you. Thank you, Dr. Baskerville. Okay. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to mark the senator down as undecided. Uh, <laughs> 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 uh, but, uh, <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you for pulling us together. Uh, thank you, Dr. Bradshaw. Thank you very much. Well, Doc? No? I just want to thank you. I want to give you a hand.